Testing. Testing. Test. All right, we're good. Nicio. We want Q Laura's opinion. We want Q Laura's opinion. Q Laura is not a real person, but I suppose we can get Q Laura's opinion. Pretty Boo, come yell into the mic. When's the last time you were here? Pretty Boo wishes you a happy Tuesday. Pretty Boo, do you have an opinion on Q Laura? No? Okay. Uh, the cat's name is Boo. And Petit means small, so that, that's what we call her in this house. We call her Petit Boo. Welcome to a Tuesday stream. We're going to be reading a paper today. This is a, a kind of a hairy paper. It's a very heavy computer science, you know, quantization, data types. So, you know, I kind of like these papers because in order to get through these type of papers, you have to end up basically getting quite familiar with a bunch of different concepts and I think quantization is a technique that is going to stay and I think it's going to be very important and I feel like if you're doing anything in machine learning you have any kind of job or anything in the real world with machine learning you kind of need to understand quantization and all the different kind of trade-offs and all the different techniques and what it means and so on. So this paper uh, Qlora, Efficient Fine-Tuning of Quantized LMs. Uh, this is the main author here, Tim Detmers. This guy is very good at quantization. He has been pushing quantization kind of uh, content and research for a while now. He, I think he has his own blog. Detmers, let me make sure. Yeah, publications. But he has some pretty good uh, blogs that we've actually read before as well. We've read this as well, which GPU to get for deep learning. I know that people love to kind of like theory craft about which GPU is the best. I think people just love buying things. So one of the, one of the very common things you see in kind of machine learning communities is which GPU should I buy because people love to think about that for some reason. But Tim is also the uh, author of the Bits and Bytes library, which is a very popular GitHub repo, which allows you to basically uh, do a bunch of different quantizations. And this is, Bits and Bytes is generic. So this is, a, if you have any kind of PyTorch code, it allows you to quantize it and hopefully make a smaller version of that model. But uh, this repo here, Artidoro Qlora, Artidoro is the second author here. So this repo is the actual, uh, 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 code that was used for this paper. So if you just want to do quantization, just generic quantization for your own project, this is the repo that you want. You want bits and bytes, but if you want uh, specifically quantization for LLMs and then specifically, I think they use Llama, you want to use this repo. Uh, but I think that's that's pretty much it right there, guys. And maybe one more thing, this uh, uh, talk here, so this is inside the Discord. Someone posted this and I ended up watching it. It's actually really good. It's basically Tim himself going over uh, the basically this paper, but not really this paper, right? He's just kind of giving a presentation on his research and obviously there's a lot of kind of similarities between what he's doing now, what he did before and this paper, so. We're going to be using this uh, because he has some pretty good uh, little figures and drawings here that I think will be useful for explanation purposes. So let's go ahead and get started. We present QLora, an efficient fine-tuning approach that reduces memory usage enough to fine-tune a 65 billion parameter model. So this is obviously the uh, Llama 65B, let's put it blue, on a single 48 gigabyte GPU. So this seems a little intense, but basically I think there's a specific, I think it's either the P100 or the A100, but one of these GPUs has exactly, yeah, 64 gigs of memory. So if you have a single A100 on a kind of a consumer uh, 
computer, then you can basically fit the entire 65 billion parameter llama model on it. That's generally kind of unusual because generally if you have a GPU that has this much memory on it, generally you have access to like a server rack that's going to have like eight GPUs on it. So I don't know. It's a, it's a little, it's a little bit weird, right? It's like who has a really, really good GPU, but still has consumer uh, computer. Generally, if you have access to this type of GPU, you have access to a server rack. Uh, while preserving the full 16-bit fine-tuning task performance. So uh, fine-tuning is the uh, process of pushing additional gradients into your neural net for some new task. And then ideally, you're trying to adapt a neural network which is trained on one task into a different task. So uh, fine-tuning can be done Generally, training is done at a 32-bit precision, but you can also do training at 16-bit precision. And then in this paper, they're going to actually do it at even lower precision. They're going to do it at 4-bit. So every time you reduce the precision, you drastically uh, increase the uh, efficiency of the model in terms of uh, memory and compute. OK. Kilora backpropagates gradients through a frozen, right? So frozen means that they're taking the llama model and they're not changing the weights of it at all, right? They're taking the original llama model and it's frozen. And whenever they say backpropagate gradients through, they're not actually going to change any of the values in the llama model. What they're going to do is they're going to make a low rank adapter here, LoRa, right? This is something that we've read on the channel uh, read about on the channel as well, which is basically kind of like a little mini extra model that you kind of attach to the original model and then you freeze the original model and then you basically just push the gradients only inside this little LoRa, right? And it's actually a great idea, right? Because now not only can you take this large model and not only can, and then you can fit it on your single GPU because you quantize it from 32 bits down to 60 or down to four bits, but then you also don't need to basically push gradients into the entire model because uh, you're actually freezing the entire model. You only need to push gradients into this LoRa. So to me, quantized uh, LoRa fine tuning is probably the most efficient type of fine tuning. It's the quickest type of time fine tuning and it's the one of the only types of fine tuning that you can do where you can do it on a consumer GPU in your house. So I think this approach is probably going to dominate the kind of like fine-tuning literature. Uh, all right, our best model family, which we call Guanaco. Guanaco is a different type of llama. I'm pretty sure it's like, a, it looks like a llama, but it's not a llama. Yeah, it's like basically this thing, kind of basically a llama. And obviously it's tongue in cheek that it's kind of like a reference to the fact that they're using llama. So Guanaco being a species that's similar to a llama, that's where the name comes from. Outperforms all previously openly released models on the Vicuna benchmark. I think Vicuna is also an animal that's similar to a llama. And uh, this is the paper, I think Stanford was the paper, where they basically took llama, fine-tuned it on answers from uh, GPT-4, and then realized that it basically felt like GPT. Uh, reaching 99.3 of the performance level of chat GPT. So, I mean, this is a little bit... There, there isn't like necessarily a good way to measure model performance, you know, like benchmarking and is still a little bit of a, of an art and there's a lot of different benchmarks. So when you see these numbers, 99.3% of the performance level, that's not like, don't read into that too much necessarily because benchmarks and, and kind of performance is still not like super easy to quantize and you're just kind of guesstimating. Uh, while only requiring 24 hours of fine tuning on a single GPU, this is the big, huge. I think that the fact that you can do this is is really important for the AI community, right? And I was thinking about this myself. Like I was thinking about potentially doing a little bit of research and doing some projects. And immediately the first thing that I thought of is like, okay, well, if I want to do some machine learning research, I can't be doing any kind of machine learning research where I need to train something because that means I'm going to have to spend like $10,000 on compute in order to have any kind of interesting result. But if, if I choose some kind of research project that only requires fine tuning and does this kind of LoRa fine tuning, then I can do it with just the GPUs that have, I have at home. So 
I think that the availability of compute is going to mean that a lot of research is going to be using this kind of pattern, this like quantized LoRa, because you can do this on a single GPU, which means that you're 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 capable of doing research that doesn't require some kind of in industry partner that's going to pay for the G for the compute. Uh, QLoRa introduces a number of innovations to save memory without sacrificing performance. Okay, so this is the innovations that they're doing for this paper, their contribution. So 4-bit normal float, so some kind of new data type uh, that is information theoretically optimal for normally distributed weights. Uh, information theory is a kind of a type of statistics and math that was uh, p pioneered by Claude Shannon, this guy. Uh, this guy was pretty badass, dude. He, a lot of kind of uh, the OG kind of computer science comes out of this guy. Known as the father of information theory. Uh, normally distributed weights. This means weights, the weights of a neural net that follow a normal distribution. So if you took all the little values of all the little weights inside a neural net, right? So 65 billion parameter model, that's gonna, that means there's like 65 billion of these little neuron weights. There's a couple other different types of things like biases and, and, and so on, but most of them are going to be weights. And if you basically plotted all of them and each of them has a single little float value, they would be normally distributed. So this is uh, this is a little bit of a uh, an assumption, right? You're you're you have a prior. So a prior means that you're making some kind of assumption on the stati statistical distribution of something that you're interested in. And uh, having a normal prior saying, okay, well, I'm going to assume that whatever this thing that is that I'm studying, it's distributed uh, according to a normal distribution. That's a usually a pretty standard prior that people use, but it is important to point out that it's not necessarily guaranteed that you're going to have normally distributed weights. But I think for a neural net, that's a pretty, pretty good and safe assumption. Uh, double quantization. Okay, so double quantization is something that reduces the average memory footprint by quantizing the quantization constants. Okay, we'll see exactly what they mean by this, but this kind of rhymes with the residual quantization that we saw in that audio paper. And then we have paged optimizers to manage memory spikes. Okay, the optimizers are like the uh, Atom, right, SGD, right? If you're familiar with PyTorch or, or even TensorFlow, there's basically you have to pick your optimizer and there's a bunch of different optimizers. Most people use Atom. Those optimizers have a bunch of internal uh, basically parameters. And whenever you're pushing gradients and in between batches, those optimizers have uh, like basically a bunch of uh, extra parameters that you need to keep track of, right? So paged optimizers maybe refers to some kind of quantization over those specific optimizers or maybe uh, here, the fact that they're talking about memory spikes may be specific tricks that prevent you from having to like load things into memory and, and so on. Uh, let me, I can like hear myself in the background. Let me turn off the sound here. Okay, we use QLoRa to fine tune more than 1000 models. So big ablation studies is what I'm seeing from this, providing a detailed analysis of instruction following and chatbot performance across eight instruction data sets. So this is where their benchmarks are gonna come from, their performance level, multiple model types, Llama and T5. Okay, so these are the models they're gonna use. And models that scale, I don't even know what my colors are anymore. <laughs> models that scales that would be infeasible to run with regular fine tuning. Yeah, so what does he mean here? So it, you're never going to be able to basically push gradients into the full 65 billion llama or 33 billion llama. You you need like a distributed training rig with like dozens of GPUs in order to even push a single gradient into a 65 billion parameter model. So that's what makes this so powerful is that you can fine tune these big models. Our results show that QLoRa fine tuning on a small high quality data set leads to state of the art results. This is similar to what we saw with the Lima paper where you don't actually need that big of a data set if you're gonna be fine tuning. Even when using smaller models in the previous state of the art, we provide a detailed analysis of chatbot performance on both human and GPT-4 evaluations. So one thing that uh, people do now is they 
don't just have a human judge uh, the output, but they have GPT-4 judge the output, which is kind of crazy as GPT-4 picks which of the answers is the best. Showing that GPT-4 evaluations are cheap and reasonable alternative to human evaluation. We have our AI is what evaluates our AI. Furthermore, we find that the current chatbot benchmarks are not trustworthy to accurately evaluate the performance level of chatbots. Okay, so a little bit of a contradiction here. They say GPT-4 evaluations are cheap and reasonable, but then they're not trustworthy and accurate, so a little bit conflicting there. A lemon pick analysis. <laughs> I like this. So cherry picking is whenever people uh, pick the best possible results in order to showcase in their paper. This happens in all different types of science, right? Where if you're looking at some kind of computer vision paper, maybe they're doing image generation, they're always gonna pick the, the prettiest images for their their uh, paper. So you never actually get a, a, a good idea of how good the thing actually is because you're only looking at the cherries, AKA the best ones. So lemon picking here refers to, we try to purposefully pick the worst ones. Uh, Guanaco fails. We release all of our models are in code, including CUDA kernels for 4-bit training. So CUDA kernels are basically uh, programming that happens below the level of uh, the language that you write in generally Python, right? You're writing your PyTorch, your high-level code in Python, and that gets compiled down into basically CUDA kernels that are what actually runs on your GPU. So in order to use their special 4-bit normal float and some of these other tricks that are going to come up with here, you're probably going to have to uh, use the CUDA kernels that they wrote specifically. Fine-tuning large language models is a highly effective way to improve their performance and to add desirable or remove undesirable behaviors. However, fine-tuning very large models is prohibitively expensive. Regular 16-bit fine-tuning of the Llama 65B requires more than 780 gigabytes of GPU memory. So we were looking at the A100. The A100 has 64 gigs of memory. So if you wanted to fine-tune a Llama 65B at 16-bit precision, 780 divided by 64. You're talking 12 A100s. And not only, the reason that number is terrible is because actually server racks only fit eight. So now you can't even use one server rack with eight A100s. You would need to use two server racks in order to fit that. And that's not even at 32-bit, that's at 16-bit, so. That kind of gives you an idea of how unapproachable it is to actually push gradients into the full uh, llama model. While recent quantization methods can reduce the memory footprints of LLMs, such techniques only work for inference and breakdown during training. Hmm. Okay. We demonstrate for the first time that it is possible to fine tune a quantized four bit model without any performance degradation. Okay, but I think it, it's important to note here that they're not actually pushing gradients at a 4-bit precision into the original model, right? Here, they say that uh, the techniques uh, break down during training, right? If you try to, if you put the Llama 65B in 4-bit precision and try to train it at that, it's not going to work. But the reason it works in this paper is because they're freezing it. Right, so they're not actually pushing gradients into the quantized four-bit llama. They're pushing gradients into this LoRa that's kind of sitting on, that's kind of like parasitically attached to the model. Right, so that's kind of the important distinction there is that they're not really fine-tuning a quantized four-bit model. They're fine-tuning a low-rank adapter, which is attached to a quantized four-bit model. So I think that's important to notice there. Uh, our method, QLora, uses a novel high-precision technique to quantize a pre-trained model to 4-bit and then adds a small set of learnable lower-rank adapter weights that are tuned by back-propagating gradients through the quantized weights. Yeah, You're really only the, the uh, LoRa is the one that receives the gradients. 
but the way that the chain rule works, you have to back propagate through the quantized model. So that's what they mean through here is that even though only the weights in the LoRa are changing, the chain rule and kind of uh, back propagation, right? The actual math that you have to do has to go through that quantized model. QLoRa reduces the average memory requirements of fine tuning a 65 billion parameter model from greater than 780 gigabytes to 48 less than 48 gigabytes without degrading the runtime or predictive performance compared to a 16 bit fully fine tuned baseline. Okay, so this is going to be uh, what they use as a baseline. This marks a significant shift in accessibility of LLM fine tuning. Now the largest publicly available models to date fine tunable on a single GPU. Yeah, I think that's huge. That that to me is the biggest contribution of this paper. It's the most important thing. And to me, this sentence right here is the reason why open source AI is going to be possible. If if you were not able to even load these models on a single consumer GPU, nobody would be able to compete with the big companies. But because you can do that, because you can fine tune the 65 billion parameter llama on your consumer GPU, I think that that means that open source is still alive. Using QLoRa, we train the Guanaco family of models with the second best model reaching 97% of the performance level of ChatGPT while being trainable in less than 12 hours on a single consumer GPU. Using a single professional GPU over 24 hours, we achieve 99% with our largest model. Uh, essentially closing the gap to ChatGPT on the Vicuña benchmark. When deployed, our smallest Guanaco model requires just five gigabytes of memory and outperforms a 26 gigabyte alpaca model by more than 20 percentage points. Okay, so we have ELO ratings. So ELO is a kind of uh, rating system that they use in chess, but it's actually very popular in video games as well. So basically it it rewards you for beating people who are good and doesn't penalize you too much for losing people to losing people who are good, right? So it's basically it. It's a way of getting a score for how good you are that is aware of the level of the people you're playing against. Uh, there's ways to game ELO, but it's generally pretty good. So the winner of the match is determined by GPT-4, which is a little bit weird, <laughs> right? <laughs> is that... GP, you basically have some kind of question and then each LLM gives an answer and then GPT-4 declares which response is better. So it's a little bit weird that GPT-4 has decided that GPT-4 is the best, right? So that's, that's what I mean by take a little bit, take these results with a little grain of salt because you're asking GPT-4 which answer it prefers. And of course, it's, it's probably always going to prefer the GPT-4 answer. 95% confidence intervals are shown after GPT-4, Guanaco win the most matches. Okay, so this is the 65B model. This is the 41 gigabyte. So this is whenever he says uh, a single professional GPU, this is what he's referring to. There, there is no consumer GPU that has 41 gigabytes of memory, but this one here, 21 gigabytes, that's what he means by uh, consumer GPU. Because uh, 3090, which is the GPU that I have, is 24 gigs. So you could fit a Guanaco 33B on the 24 gig 3090. I think the 40-something series out of NVIDIA, which is also a consumer GPU, has the uh, ability to fit a 21 gigabyte model. Uh, cool. And it turns out that GPT kind of doesn't like BARD at all. You can see here that... GPT ranks Bard's answer is pretty much on par with Guanaco 7B, which is a significantly smaller model. So, I don't know, GPT-4 being a little bit biased there, IMO. QLoR introduces multiple innovations. 4-bit normal float, an information theoretically optimal quantization data type for normally distributed data that yields better empirical results than 4-bit integers and 4-bit floats. So... Four bits means you only have four bits to store the information. So, uh, for example, here, I think this picture is nice, but here you have floating point data types, also called FP8, right? Floating point eight. What the eight here refers to the eight bits, right? So you see here, everything in your computer is composed of these bits, right? Which are either zero or one. And computers are based on this uh, binary system. So you can see here how there's eight total bits and you have to basically decide what am I going to do with these eight bits? 
So, okay, well, at least one of the bits, I'm gonna use it to determine whether or not it's negative or positive, right? Sine. So if I have a negative number, this will be one. If I have a positive number, this will be zero, right? But now that means I only have seven bits to actually store the rest of my number. And generally, what ends up happening is you basically end up splitting these bits into what they call the exponent and the fraction. So the fraction is the actual, like, uh, mantissa exponent. See if I can find a better picture for this, but. Yeah, so any any float number, right? Let's say you have a number of some weight inside a neural net and it's 0 0.003, right? You're gonna store that 00, zero right? The, the first part of the kind of like how, how small is it in the exponent? And then you're gonna store the actual value of the number here in the mantissa, right? So if you have a bunch of numbers that are, that are close to zero, like 0 0.1, 1.0, you know, you probably don't need a bunch of these exponents, right? You'd rather keep a bunch of your uh, bits to store the fraction so you can store 0 0.11111, right? You can store more numbers, right? You have more uh, precision on the actual number. But if you have a bunch of numbers that are very, very small or very, very big, like 1000 and then 0 0.00000001, at that point, you probably want more bits for the exponent right so choosing how many bits to use for the exponent and how many bits to use for the for the uh, fraction or the mantissa is it's going to depend on what the numbers you're actually trying to quantize are right so here he says three bits for exponent four bit for fraction good for large and small numbers bad for precise numbers one bit for exponent six for fraction good for precise numbers bad for large and small numbers so there's a trade-off there, right? And 4-bit integers and 4-bit floats are just the generic 4-bit integer, 4-bit float from computer science, but he's gonna come up with a new one here which he calls 4-bit normal float, which is probably gonna have a clever version of how much am I putting in the exponent, how much in the fraction, and so on. All right, I'm all over the place, so feel free to ask questions and interrupt. Sometimes I feel like I ramble and I'll say all kinds of things that are wrong and then nobody corrects me, and then I'm like, why did nobody correct me? So feel free to comment more. <laughs> Double quantization. A method that quantizes the quantization constants, saving an average of about 0 0.37 bits for, per parameter, uh, approximately three gigabytes for a 765 gigabyte model. So this model here, the Guanaco 65B, fits in 41 gigabytes of memory, and three gigabytes of that is an efficiency coming from this double quantization. And then finally, paged optimizers using NVIDIA unified memory. So this is this is quite old at this point. I don't even know if this even matters, but here we go. See this blog post in 2017, but unified memory is a single memory address space accessible from any processor in the system. Right, so what is a processor? A processor is either your GPU or your CPU, right? And sometimes you're gonna be storing things in the uh, RAM, which is this, the memory that is normally being accessed by your CPU, and that's kind of, uh, here, let me see, motherboard, right? If you actually look at a motherboard, you have your CPU here, right? Your CPU sits right there and then your four sticks of RAM right here. So that's sometimes called the CPU memory, but it's the random access memory. It's normally the memory of your computer, right? That's that's what people refer to. But your GPU also has memory, right? Your GPU is gonna sit right here in the PCI slot, right? So there's different places to, to store things. And ideally, if your GPU is doing a bunch of calculations, your GPU being a processor, you don't want it to be accessing the memory in the motherboard, right? This RAM memory, because it takes long for the, the information to go from this RAM all the way into the GPU and then get loaded, get calculated by the GPU and then get put back to the RAM. Not, and it's better if it accesses the memory that's directly inside the GPU because there is GPU memory. Okay. Uh, to avoid the gradient checkpointing memory spikes 
that occur when processing a mini batch with a long sequence length. Okay, so this is a little bit more obscure here. I'm, I'm assuming that basically whenever, because of the way that NVIDIA Unified Memory is implemented, whenever you have a long sequence length in a mini batch, a mini batch is like one batch that you basically, when you train, you're not training one instance, one data point at a time. You're training with a little group of data points called a batch, right? So that's because of the way that it works, I guess, you basically get this memory spike whenever you try to checkpoint the gradients. I don't know what exactly what this means by this. I guess that maybe if your model's too big, you can't fit the entire gradient, so then it kind of like intermediately stores it, and that's where you get the memory spike. I don't know, if one of you people is better at uh, ECE, feel free to chime in. We combine these contributions into a better tuned LoRa approach that includes adapters at every network layer. Okay, this is kind of interesting. So, and therefore, uh, thereby avoids almost all the accuracy trade-offs seen in prior work. A100 is either 40 gigabytes or 80 gigabytes of GPU memory. The 48 gigabyte GPU they are talking about is probably an RTX 6000, A6000, or L40. Okay. How do wait? How does that? How does that make any sense though? Because here it says the A100 has 60. Oh, there's three types here. I see what you're saying. There's one that has 10, one that has 64, and then one that has 80. So you could actually get an A100 GPU that has 80 gigabytes of memory, and that would be more than enough to fit. Uh, the Guanaco 65B here. And it's also important to note that you need, uh, the memory doesn't just fit the model, it also needs to fit the batch. So if you're doing inference, you can get a GPU that's just barely bigger than your model and it's fine, right? Because you're only gonna need to pass one thing at a time. But if you're doing training, you need to be able to fit your model in the memory, but then you also need to be able to fit the entire batch into memory, right? And I think for NLP, this is probably not as big of a deal, but in uh, computer vision, it is a big deal because a lot of times if you're using, I don't know, a 224 by 224 image, right? A, th a batch of 32 224 by 224 by three images is actually a, a pretty significant amount of memory. So when you're training, your GPU memory needs to fit both the batch and the model, not just the... I think they meant memory speed is 64 gigabytes per second. Okay, so memory speed is the speed at which you can load things into the GPU memory and take things out of the GPU memory. And that actually uh, matters a lot, especially if you're kind of loading and removing things, right? And you're kind of moving things in and out of the memory. So this is the bandwidth. This is what uh, you're talking about here, the memory speed. I don't really understand it. Okay. But TLDR, you can get GPUs that can fit this, but they're uh, pretty hardcore. <laughs> uh, QLUR's efficiency enables us to perform an in-depth study. Thank you for those comments, Nisio, by the way. Uh, enables us to perform an in-depth study of instruction fine-tuning and chatbot performance on model scales that would be impossible using regular fine-tuning due to memory overhead. Therefore, we train more than 1,000 models. Uh, between 80 to 65 billion parameters, so small models and big models they're going to be training here. Very good ablation study. In addition to showing that QLoRa recovers 16-bit performance, we also analyze trends. We find that the data quality is far more important than the data set size. So this is what we were noticing uh, in the Lima paper as well. Lima is a paper that we read earlier, uh, I think last week, where basically uh, people at Facebook found that they could fine tune uh, llama models on 1000 examples and get them to perform better than the uh, original vacuna models, which I think were fine tuned on 50,000 examples. So this idea of kind of like, rather than just blindly getting more and more and more data, being uh, much more careful about data quality and making sure that the data set that you're fine tuning on is just extremely high quality is a pattern that we're seeing again and again in these research papers. Uh, so, for example, in this case, they're 9,000, uh, they have a, a data set, whatever this is, OASST1, which is 9,000, is outperforming a Flan V2 of 450,000. 
uh, even when both are meant to support instruction following generalization. However, uh, instruction following generalization, what this means is the kind of like chatbot behavior. So sometimes they call it assistant behavior. So an LLM, just a raw LLM, like the 65B Llama is just trained to predict the next token. But most people want uh, like assistant-ish behavior where like you have this kind of like back and forth, like how are you doing? And it like answers you, right? So that's what people are mostly interested in. And uh, people call this assistant behavior. Other people call this instruction following behavior. So those are all just different ways of kind of referring to this kind of like ability to conversate back and forth and like generally kind of answer your questions and do the things that you want to do. Uh, second, we show that strong, massive multitask language understanding benchmark does not imply strong Vicuna benchmark performance and vice versa. Okay, so basically they're saying that this benchmark here, Massive Multitask Language Understanding, MMLU, is garbage, which, I mean, <laughs> we could have told you. Generally, any kind of quantifiable benchmark is not going to be a like perfect, right? Especially as, as these models get better and better and better and they become more and more general, I think we're going to have to move away from single uh, kind of quantifiable scores right and then we're gonna have to move to kind of like these like kind of uh bags of benchmarks right where i think the days of being able to say hey here's my model and i trained it on ImageNet, and here's the top one accuracy on ImageNet," i think that's going to kind of go away and more and more you're going to see hey i trained this model and i benchmarked it on these 100 different benchmarks so as these models get more and more general the number of benchmarks that you use is going to keep increasing and the score on an individual benchmark is going to matter less and less. Uh, furthermore, we also provide an extensive analysis of chatbot performance. We use tournament style benchmarking. So this is what they mean by ELO here, right? So ELO is kind of a tournament style score where models compete against each other in matches to produce the best responses. The winner of a match is judged by either GPT. I think this is just weird. The fact that they're using an LM to judge the answers. The tournament results are aggregated into ELO scores, which determine the ranking of the chatbot performance. We find that GPT-4 and human evaluations largely agree on the rank of the model performance in the tournaments, but we also find that there's instances of strong disagreements. So, conflicting here. As such, we highlight that model-based evaluation, while providing a cheap alternative, also has its uncertainties. Okay. We augment our chatbot with a qualitative analysis. Our analysis highlights success and failure cases. We release all model generations with human and GPT-4 annotations to facilitate further study. We open source our code base and CUDA kernels and integrate our methods into the Hugging Face Transformer stack, making them easily accessible to all. We release a collection of adapters for 7 to 13 to 33 to 65B models, trained on eight different instructions for a total of 32 different open source. So this is not technically true. <laughs> if you actually go into the code here, you have to get uh, requires access to the llama models. So the problem is that even though these llama models are open sourced and they were leaked and released, it's like you have to basically get them yourself, which is fucked, you know? <laughs> because nobody nobody wants to post them anywhere. You have to basically get them somewhere. So for example, here, here's the model that he puts in there, but I think he's, he's, I don't know. It's like you're, you're taking a risk by putting this model up, right? Because you don't know what Facebook is gonna do, right? Because Facebook could over time eventually go back and then basically sue everyone that posted this model without their explicit per, uh, uh, blessing, right? And Facebook hasn't given anyone any explicit blessing to actually go ahead and, and give the model out. So people are a little bit sketchy about using and especially giving people the model. So it's still kind of like a legal gray area, which is a little bit sketch. Uh, different fine-tuning methods and their memory requirements. QLora improves over LoRa by quantizing the transformer to 4-bit precision and using paged optimizers to handle memory spikes. 
Nisio. And GPT-4 eval probably changes every time OpenAI updates their API, so really not satisfying, but neither is human eval. It's a hard problem. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so we have three different things here. We have 16-bit transformer, 16-bit transformer and 4-bit transformer. Okay, we have their base model. So this is the Llama 65B. Here's the Llama 65B, and then here's the Llama 65B. Uh, this one obviously looks like it's one fourth the size of this one because it is because four bit to 16 bit is going to be one fourth the size. Uh, you have the optimizer state. So the optimizer state is all the uh, gradients, all the intermediate kind of values that you calculate for your chain rule. And you need to store those in order to basically push a gradient, right? So the size of your batch is going to determine the optimizer state. The precision of your of the numbers inside that optimizer are also going to determine the optimizer state. So you can see how one of the things they really wanted to do in this paper is actually address this uh, issue of like, hey, not only is the, the model itself kind of an issue in terms of memory and compute, but then also the optimizer is an issue. We, we want to make sure to make this optimizer as small as possible. Okay, so you have parameter updates is blue, gradient flow is green, and paging flow is red. Okay, so gradient flow, you go back through the llama. You're not actually updating. Your adapters here, these are the small little extra things. I don't know why they didn't put little uh, modules here, but the adapters are the ones that are actually changing parameters. That's where you're actually changing the values of the parameters. The base model is frozen. So you see here in full fine tuning, the parameter update goes into the base model. You're actually changing the values of the parameters in the base model. But when you're doing this LoRa, low rank adaptation, you're not actually changing the values in the actual base model. You're only changing the values in these LoRa uh, parameters, which are these very small little uh, squares and rectangles here, right? And then this paging stuff, I don't really fully understand this, but it seems like basically Paging is this process where you have to go to the CPU memory and then ask the CPU, hey, can you get this specific piece of memory from the actual motherboard, the, the RAM for me? And then the CPU will be like, okay, here, I can go and get you this specific little chunk of thing that's in the RAM right now, the motherboard memory, the CPU memory. I call it the RAM because that's what the sticks are called, but there might be a more official name for that. But you see how the CPU has to be the one that gives you that. So the paging flow seems to be some way to optimize that. All right, let's get into it. We're finally getting to some equations here. Blockwise k-bit quantization. Quantization is the process of discretizing an input from a representation that holds more information to a representation with less information. Uh, so any kind of quantization is going to be lossy, right? You're gonna lose information by quantizing something. It often means taking a data type with more bits and converting it to fewer bits, right? So bits are these things here. So taking a data type such as floating point 32, which has 32 bits, right? Just think about like 32 bits, what that would look like compared to eight bits and then compared to four bits. Uh, let's close these repos here. 32-bit uh, floats to eight-bit integers uh, to ensure that the entire range of the low bit data type is used, the input data type is commonly rescaled to the target data type range through normalization by the absolute maximum of the input elements, which are usually structured as a tensor. Okay. So why are they why are they doing this? And I think it becomes obvious when you realize that you have to basically use a bunch of your bits in any data type to store this exponent, right? And that's really annoying, right? And what if instead you normalize, right? Where is it? Normalization. If you normalize your uh, your data, your each individual number, each individual little floating point, then you can make sure that it's close to zero, which means that you don't actually have to spend that many bits storing the exponent. You can just uh, use up all your bits, all of your precious bits to store the actual number itself rather than storing its, uh, yeah. So for example here, so here he's storing, uh, the number six zero six. So this is the actual number here, six zero six, right. And everything else here. So this is just whether or not it's negative or positive, but then these two 
numbers here are what actually allows you to make it 0 0.606 or 0 0.0606 or 0 0.0000606, right? And the more uh, exponents you have, the more you can basically make this number either very big or very small, right? Where e to the negative 3 refers to basically like how big or small the number is. Uh, but if you normalize them, then you don't have to spend uh, as many bits on the actual uh, size or the exponent, uh, which are usually structured as a tensor. For example, quantizing a 32-bit floating point tensor into an int 8 tensor with a range of negative 127 to 127. So uh, any data type has a maximum or uh, and minimum, which basically means what is the maximum number I can represent with uh, int 8, and that's going to be different from the maximum number I can represent with a floating point 32. So for example, what is the max, actually let's ask Bard. This seems like an easy question for Bard. There's no way it can hallucinate something here. What is the maximum value for a uh, FP32 versus a uint8 versus a int8? So uint8 is an unsigned int8, which means that you're saving the sign bit, right? You don't have to spend any on the uh, or any bits, any of your precious bits on the sign because it basically means it's always positive. So, for example, if you have a uint8, you can store up until 255, right? So you can store from 0 to 255. uint8 is very common in images. That's why images, for example, uh, any of the pixel values is between 0 and 255, right? 8 bit, unsigned 8 bit, very popular in images int 8, because you now have to basically use that one bit to store whether it's negative or positive, now you can't basically store as many numbers, which means that int 8 is limited to negative 127 to 127 here. I don't know if this is a typo or not, negative 128. I don't know. But floating point 32, significantly bigger. Look at that. You can store a number up until... Uh, 3.4 e to the 38 so you can store huge numbers in a floating point 32 okay so what do they got here so absolute max of floating point 32 times floating point 32 so here's the normalization by the absolute maximum so you're taking the number the floating point 32, you're dividing it by the maximum of all the different floating point 32s that you want to store, so normalizing them so that they're basically centered on zero. You're binning them into 127 possible bins, and then you're rounding here, so you're going to you're gonna lose precision, right? You're, you're going to have numbers that basically, let me see, this is a nice one, right? So let's say you have a continuous uh, value here represented by the red line, and then you quantize it, represented by these bins. So this value here is going to be the same as this value here because you're just storing it into this bin. So that's why this round, you're, you're fundamentally doing a kind of lossy, uh, lossy, tra um, what would I call this? You're losing information because of this round, right? You're losing precision. Uh, C is the quantization constant or quantization scale. So I guess the quantization constant is 127 divided by the absolute max of whatever the X FP32 is, which is going to depend on your data. Dequantization is the inverse. So if you just divide by this quantization constant, then you get back the original number, but this original number is not going to be the same as this original number, right? Because you lost some precision with this round. Let's go ahead and uh, highlight this in green. Okay, the problem with this approach is that if a large magnitude value, i.e. an outlier, occurs in the input tensor, the quantization bits, certain bit combinations, are not utilized well with few or some numbers quantized in some bins. So, the the problem is that anytime you do normalization, if you have an outlier, your normalization is going to be a little bit fucked up, right? So for example here, so I think here he says he has an outlier. Yeah. So for example, here is what uh, the quant, he's using the same amount of quantization bits or quantization bins, sorry. So you see here, every single one of these bins, is there's the same number of bins in this as in this, 
But what he's showing you here is that if you have an outlier here, let's say you had a, uh, you had a data point that was at negative 10. Now, the amount of bins that you have underneath the majority of your distribution here, the majority of your normal distribution, you're only basically modeling this in one, two, three, four, five, six bins, right? Versus if you didn't have that outlier that was sitting there at negative 10, now look how many bins you're you're able to do. You're able to have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, right? 13 bins that are sitting right under that big probability mass there. So outliers basically make quantization less efficient because they need to basically uh, have bins in a uh, part of this range here that doesn't actually store very much. It's just sitting, it's, the reason that's happening is because you're normalizing and then you have this one big outlier. Uh, certain bit combinations are not utilized well with few, with few or no numbers quantized in some bins. Right, so what is he referring to here? He's referring to the fact that here you have a bunch of bins that are sitting here at negative four, negative five, negative six, negative eight. These bins don't even have a single value in them. You're just wasting, uh, your limited bits to store that, or bins in this case. Uh, a common approach is to chunk the input tensor into blocks that are then independently quantized. Okay, so if your quantization constant is going to depend on the absolute maximum of your, uh, of all the data points that you have and that you're trying to quantize, and your quantization is in that way uh, very dependent or sensitive to outliers, one thing you can do is say, okay, well, if I have 100 data points, let me break up those data points into chunks of 10, and then I'll normalize each one of those independently, right? So each uh, chunk of 10 data points from my original uh, set of 100 data points is going to have their own, it's going to have its own quantization constant, C. So you're going to you're now you're going to have to store 10 quantization constants, which is a little bit annoying, right? So there's this kind of trade-off where do I chunk it and quantize each chunk, at which point I need to store 10 of these quantization constants, or do I have one quantization constant for the original 100, and then I have to deal with the fact that outliers might mess up my uh, quantization. So there's this kind of trade-off between how much, how many quantization constants do you want to store versus how many outliers do you have. Uh, we chunk the input tensor X, so into n contiguous blocks, so X is the input tensor, which is going to be basically any collection of data, right, that you're quantizing. And it's probably, it's gonna, in this case, it's going to be the actual base model of the llama, right, uh, into N contiguous blocks of size B. So N is the number of chunks. And then B is the size of each chunk. By flattening the input tensor and slicing the linear segment into N equals B times H over B blocks. We quantize these blocks independently with equation one to create a quantized tensor and n quantization constants. So this is the annoying part is that now you have n different quantization constants that you need to keep track of. And I think that's what they're referring to here when they talk about double quantization, a method that quantizes the quantization constants. <laughs> so this is like some 500 IQ sh thing right here where they're like, hey, let's uh, chunk our our set of numbers into a bunch of chunks, quantize each of those chunks. The problem with that is now we have a bunch of quantization constants, but what if we quantize those quantization constants? So uh, a little bit of almost like a recursion kind of mentality there. Okay, so low rank adapter LoRa fine tuning is a method that reduces memory requirements by using a small set of trainable parameters, often termed adapters, while not updating the full parameters which remain fixed. Yeah, so LoRa is based on this low rank matrix uh, kind of math, where basically you have some matrices that uh, are lower rank than others. The rank is a specific property of a matrix, which basically comes down to like how many independent uh, that's a better definition of Laura. Low rank matrices. Before I say some stupid shit, let me give you a better definition. Low rank approximation is measures the fit between the given matrix, blah, blah, blah. Uh, approximate the matrix as a reduced rank. Okay. Okay. 
these are all even worse. <laughs> but basically, one, one way to think about it is that a low rank adapter is an extra little set of weights that you basically attach to the original base model, and then those little weights are just adding just enough little signal into the original model that the original model changes its behavior, right? Uh, and the key point here is that they're not updating the full model parameters. They're not changing the frozen uh, base model. They're only pushing gradients into the low rank uh, matrices. Gradient during stochastic gradient descent are passed through the fixed pre-trained model weights to the adapter. And it's important to note that the passing through is still going to increase, you're still going to have to store those intermediate values, and that's where this optimizer state can get out of hand, uh, which is updated to optimize the loss function. Laura augments a linear projection through an additional factorized projection. Given the projection xw equals y, Laura computes, okay, here we have a bunch of different things here. So we have xw equals y. We have x is some matrix of size b times h. W is some matrix of times H times O. And then you have Y equals XW. So that's just this equation here, but now they're adding this here. X times L1 and L2, where L1 is a matrix of size H times R, and L2 is a matrix of size R times O, and S is a scalar. So, Jesus. it's a lot of kind of undefined terms here. I think the, they defined all these numbers up here. So B is... What is B? Constant C, N. I don't really tell you what B is. I guess B is probably the batch size. But this here is basically a concatenation. I think if you look at a picture of Laura, Laura fine tuning. Yeah, right here. So you see how the, the matrix here, this is the pre-trained model, right? The pre-trained 65 billion parameter llama. This is the LoRa, the like much smaller amount of weights. And you see how here they're getting concatenated. So all you're doing is you're basically adding this little model that just like kind of parasitically attaches to the original model. And then you're pushing gradients into that. But uh, there's an ad on this, dude, what the fuck? Oh my God, no, this is trash. I just want this picture. Open image and new tab. Yeah, but ultimately you're basically just taking the output of this and then combining it with the output of the original model. So ideally the LoRa matrix should basically add little bits. It, it's it's gonna take all the activations from your original base model and just add a little bit to one, remove a little bit from one, add a little bit to one, remove a little bit from one. And just by nudging the activations slightly like that, you're gonna get different behavior. So that's what this plus is here. I think this is the actual LoRa and then this part here is the original, right? So X is generally the input to a neural net. Y is generally the output or the target. W generally means the weights. And then I think L1 and L2 are the LoRa's here. All right, memory requirement of parameter efficient fine tuning. One important point of discussion is the memory requirement of LoRa during training in both terms of the number and the size of adapters used. Since the memory footprint of LoRa is so minimal, right, because it's a small, low rank matrix, we can use more adapters to improve performance without significantly increasing the met total memory use. So more adapters, they basically mean that here, this is uh, a LoRa on a specific uh, layer, right? You have some specific layer that you're gonna put these in and they're gonna be doing it at every single layer, right? So your big 65B llama is just a bunch of transformer blocks like stacked and they're gonna have a little LoRa for each transformer block or each layer within that. I don't know if they specifically do it at the transformer block. They might be doing it at the little MLP. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, while LoRa was designed as a parameter efficient fine tuning method, most of the memory footprint for LLM fine tuning comes from activation gradients and not from the learned LoRa parameters. So this is kind of what they're saying is that a lot of this is that a lot of your memory is actually coming from the optimizer state. It's coming from these activations and the gradients and having to do this, basically this chain rule in the backprop. For a 7B llama, 
model train on Flan V2 with a batch size of 1. The Laura weights equivalent to commonly used 0.2% of the original model weight, so very small compute fo uh, footprint by the Laura weights. But the Laura input gradients have a memory footprint of 600, 567 megabytes. So this is a, a good little uh, indica indication of the relative uh, size of those parameters, right? 567 megabytes used for the gradients and the optimization parameters versus 26 megabytes for the actual values of the LoRa parameters or the weights inside the LoRa matrices. With gradient checkpointing, the input gradients reduce to an average of 18 megabytes per sequence, making them more memory intensive than all the LoRa weights combined. I don't know what this means. I don't know why this 18 megabyte number is different than this 100, 567, but okay, let's keep going. In comparison, the 4-bit base model consumes 5,000 megabytes of memory. So actually the base model is still pretty big. The highlights, this highlights that gradient checkpointing is important, but also that aggressively reducing the amount of lore of parameter yields only minor memory benefits. This means that we can use more adapters without significantly increasing the overall training memory footprint. More adapters, aka, I don't think they mean using a bigger adapter. They mean using more LoRa matrices throughout the model so that you can change the behavior of all the different uh, levels of the model, right? And I think that in some of the LoRa papers, they only add the LoRa to the last couple layers. So I think... Uh, I forget what paper we were looking at, but I think it was a, the PFT paper, maybe. But in one of the papers, they basically say how depending on where you put these LoRa matrices, you're going to get uh, different types of behavior, right? If you put your LoRa matrices at the bottom versus at the top, you're going to be basically modifying the behavior of the LLM at different levels of abstraction. So maybe by being able to put these LoRa matrices throughout the entire model, you're gonna get a better kind of fine tuning result. This is crucial for recovering full 16-bit precision performance. Okay, Q LoRa fine tuning. Q LoRa achieves high fidelity four-bit fine tuning via two techniques, the four-bit normal float, NF4, and double quantization. Additionally, we introduced paged optimizers to prevent memory spikes during gradient checkpointing from causing out-of-memory errors that have traditionally made fine-tuning difficult for large models. Okay. So now we're, we're learning more about this exact problem of the paged optimizers that they keep mentioning here. So it sounds like basically when you're doing this gradient checkpointing, the memory will spike and whenever the memory spikes, you get an out of memory error. And the problem with these out of memory errors, if you're doing any kind of machine learning stuff, is it kills your th your your program. As soon as you get this oom, the CUDA, the, the dreaded CUDA out of memory error, it kills your entire program. So, need fine tuning difficult for large models. Right, so if you, if you can't solve these oom errors, then you're not gonna be able to fine tune on a single machine. And nothing sucks more than uh, running, st you run your model and then you go do something else and it runs for two hours and then you come back and it's out of memory, <laughs> which usually sucks. Uh, QLora has one low precision storage data type. In our case, it's usually 4-bit and one computation data type that is usually bfloat 4. In practice, this means whenever a QLora weight tensor is used, we dequantize the tensor to bfloat 16, then perform a matrix multiplication in 16-bit. Huh, this is kind of weird. That means that they're storing the data type in 4-bit, but then when they actually do the matrix multiplication, they turn it into a floating point 16. Huh. I wonder how much that conversion takes, though, right? How long does this dequantization take? Is that something that's efficient, or is that something that's going to take a long time? We now discuss the components of QLora, followed by a formal definition. 
the 4-bit normal float. The normal float data type builds on quantile quantization, which is information, theoretic, information theoretically optimal data type that ensures each quantization bin. So a quantile is basically uh, splitting a uh, uh, distribution into these like chunks. Everybody knows about uh, uh, quartiles, which is basically whenever you split a normal distribution into four. Yeah, so let me see if I can get the wiki here. So there's different types of quant of uh, quantiles. Everybody knows this one, the quartiles, where you basically split it into four chunks. So you have the normal distribution here, and then you split it, and then basically each one of these bins has the same amount of uh, points in it, right? So obviously the bins that are closer here to the mean, they're gonna be less wide because there's just more numbers in there. And then these bins here, they're much wider, but it also, uh, because there's less uh, points here, right, because the number of points goes down, uh, they actually have the same amount of probability mass, if you want to think of it that way, per probability density, right? So 25% of the data is here in this Q4, 25% is here in Q3, then Q2, then Q1, and so on. Uh, each quantization bin has equal values assigned from the input tensor. Quantile quantization works by estimating the quantile of the input tensors through the empirical cumulative distribution function. Okay, so this is what we were referring to at the very beginning of this paper where they're making an assumption here, right? They're gonna, they're gonna pick a prior and the prior that they're gonna pick is uh, the normal distribution. So they're gonna say, uh, optimal for normally distributed weights, right? So they're gonna say, I'm going, I'm going to assume that the weights inside my neural net are normally distributed. And that means that if they're normally distributed, then I can go ahead and say, okay, well, if they're normally distributed, then I know that I need to basically make the bins or the quantiles here close to the center of the, of the distribution, which should be zero because you're normalizing it. They sh I should have more bins here in the center that are that are thin and then less bins as I kind of go out towards the end. It took me forever to realize that the NF4 data type is just like a four bit lookup table to the values in appendix E. Uh, you're telling me that there's an appendix E? Let's see. It's control F appendix E. Click on that. Can I click on this? There we go, boom. Okay, the exact values of the N4 data type are as follows. All right, so we see that the, the NF4 data type is limited to negative one to one. So basically, if you remember, we were looking at BARD, you see this int eight, uint eight. Uint eight can represent any number between zero and 255 as long as it's an integer, right? So any any integer between zero and 255. Int eight can represent any integer between negative 127 to 127. Floating point 32 can represent any float number up until this, right? And here, NF4, this weird like four bit float data type can only represent numbers between negative one and one, but that is actually totally fine because anytime you're doing uh, a neural network, you're normalizing everything constantly, right? Your layer normalizations, your batch normalization, you're normalizing your input, you're generally taking every single uh, every single uh, batch or every single part, like for example, whenever you load ImageNet batches, you're normalizing them by the actual mean of each channel uh, in ImageNet. So you're constantly normalizing things whenever you're dealing with machine learning. So this kind of data type that is only possible for negative 1.0 to 1.0 is actually totally fine. And what we were saying before, right, where if you assume, I'm kind of all over the place, so let me know if anything I say is confusing because I'm kind of jumping from place to place here. But uh, we were saying, let's go here, that because you have this normal distribution, right, you wanna have more bins in the middle than you do in the outside, right? The outside bins are not that important. And you notice that here, right? You notice here how the difference here between 0 0.722 and 1.0, there's there's 0 0.3 in between those. But if you look at the one here, look how much smaller this bin is, right? So right around the center, the size of this bin is 0 
that's a much smaller bin right next to the middle, right? So the bin here in the middle is only 0.07 versus the bin at the end is basically three times bigger. So, okay, let's keep going. Uh, the main limitation of quantile quantization is that the process of quantile estimation is expensive. Okay, so quantile estimation is picking uh, which quantiles you're going to use. So, of course, they're just going to say that, hey, we're just going to uh, pick quantiles based on our assumptions. Therefore, fast quantile uh, approximation algorithms such as SRAM quantiles, I don't really know what this says, but I assume it's some fancy way of picking quantiles, are used to estimate them. Due to the approximate nature of these quantile estimation algorithms, the data type has a large quantization error for outliers, which are often the most important values. And this is something that uh, Tim talks about a lot in this lecture, which I highly recommend this lecture. It's, it's very good. But he mentions how basically you don't want to get rid of outliers because like, it's almost like the outliers are where the intelligence comes from in the neural net. It's like if you get rid of these outliers and you'd like normalize them to hell, the performance isn't quite there. So there's this kind of weird... Uh, kind of relationship between the amount of outliers and the like intelligence of the neural net and it's something that he touches on more and more and more and we'll see kind of what he argues in this paper but it was an intent or it was a very interesting kind of outcome of this uh, work here. Uh, extensive quantile estimates and approximation errors can be avoided when input tensors come from, come, come from a distribution fixed up by a quantization constant. In such cases, input tensors have the same quantiles making exact quantile estimation computationally feasible. Okay, so they're basically saying up in, up here, they said we're going to pick a quantization constant. And in fact, they're not just going to pick one. They're actually going to chunk and then chunk the input into a bunch of different chunks and then pick a quantization constant for each chunk. But once you basically normalize all these numbers, you're going to have that quantization constant. But because everything is now normalized, you can just decide what these quantiles are, right? So you, you don't have to do this, this fancy SRAM quantile estimation every time. You can just basically pick the quantiles, which is what they did here. They just pick these quantiles, which generally work well for normally distributed numbers between zero or negative one and one. And then they don't have to basically calculate every time. Uh, since pre-trained neural network weights usually have a zero-centered normal distribution, a keyword there usually, but not necessarily, uh, with a standard deviation of sigma, we can transform all weights to a single fixed distribution by scaling sigma such that the distribution fits exactly to the range of our data type. So as soon as they have a single fixed distribution, then they can use the same quantiles for everything, and they can basically use the same NF4 data type. For our data type, we set the arbitrary range, negative 1 to 1. Uh, feels arbitrary, but it's not arbitrary. You know, I think, I think that's a pretty good assumption. As such, both the quantiles for the data type and the neural network weights need to be normalized to this range. And this is where, as soon as you have this n need to be normalized to this range, this is where you're going to have the issues with the outliers, right? Because normalization is going to depend on the outlier, right? Because when you normalize things, you're basically taking any mo any amount of points and then stretching them so that they fit within a specific range, in this case, ne negative one to one. But if you have an outlier, now the way that that's kind of stretched out is gonna be not as good. Uh, the information theoretically optimal data type for zero mean normal distributions with arbitrary standard deviations is computed as follows. Okay, so now that they've kind of put all these boundaries here, they say, okay, there's it, there's some standard deviation sigma, there's some range negative one to one, it's zero mean, it's a normal distribution. So with all these extra kind of assumptions, now you can actually just use information theory to say what is the best data type for this. Okay, and this is gonna be how they actually get it. Estimate the two K plus one quantiles in a theoretical N zero one distribution. So this is a normal distribution centered on zero with a standard deviation of one to obtain the k-bit quantile quantization data type for normal distributions. Take this data type, normalize its values into the negative 1 to 1, quantize an input weight tensor by normalizing it to negative 1 to 1 range through absolute maximum rescaling. This is where the uh, outliers are going to come in. Once the weight range and the data type range max, 
or match, we can quantize as usual. Step three is equivalent to rescaling the standard deviation of the weight tensor to match the standard deviation of the k-bit data type. More formally, we end to estimate the two to the k values of qi into the, of the data type as follows. So k-bit, so this is the number of bits. So uh, here they're doing nf4, so this is gonna be four bits, right? So for k equals, I guess, 0 to 1, so you plug in k here, and this will give you, this is probably how they got these values here. It's a quantile function of the standard normal distribution, a problem for symmetric k-bit quantization. Symmetric, I think here refers to the fact that it's symmetric on negative and positive, right? This number, 0 0.795, ooh, it's actually, this is not symmetric. Huh, that's weird. You see this? This is 0 0.07 and then 0 and then negative 0 0.09. That's fucking weird. Why is that not symmetric? Huh. I guess one reason it wouldn't be symmetric is that um, maybe ReLU activations. You know, like certain activation functions, they don't have any value on the negative. They only have positive value, or at least they bias towards that, right? So maybe there's something there. I don't know. This is kind of weird. I don't know why this is not symmetric. My guess is ReLUs, but I don't know. Because uh, even number of values probably and want to have zero. problem for k is that this approach does not have an exact representation of zero which is an important property to quantize padding and or other zero valued elements with no zero so what does it mean does that it does not have an exact representation of zero so what it means is that uh, if you look at the where's the quantile here you have two quantiles here you have bins right and you have a bin for everything that's slightly above zero and you have a bin for everything that's slightly below zero so if you notice there's no bin that is actually right at zero, right? Because you're pretty much almost never gonna have, so any if a value is 0 0.0001, it's gonna go into this bin. If a value is negative 0 0.0001, it's gonna go into this bin. But there's nowhere for the zero to go. There's no actual, this value is exactly zero. You basically have to choose between either the slightly positive bin or the slightly negative bin. If there was 17 values, it could be symmetric around zero. Okay. Which is an important property to quantize padding and other zero valued elements with no, no error. So padding is something that's common whenever you have sequences or uh, uh, padding, convnet, I love to show these, but Anytime you have a sequence of things or you have a image that has basically some values, you can pad it. So you see the padding values here are zero and zero is a very common padding value. So they say, hey, if we're gonna be quantizing these things, we need to be able to represent exactly zero, which means why do we wanna be able to represent exactly zero? Because sometimes we have padding, which is equal to zero, or sometimes we have specific elements, which are zero. So that's why we wanna be able to have an exact representation of zero. Uh, to ensure a discrete zero point of zero and to use all two to the k bits for a k bit data type we create an asymmetric data type by estimating the quantiles qi of two ranges qi equals two to the k minus one for the negative part and two k negative one two to the k minus one plus one for the positive part okay so this is why it's not symmetric you have one more quantile for the positive which is going to be the zero one probably and then we unify these sets of QI and remove one of the two zeros that occur in both sets. Okay, so if you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven that are negative, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight that are positive, and then you have the one zero. So you have a total of 16 here, but Eight of them are positive, one of them is zero, and seven of them, seven of them are negative. Uh, we term the resulting data type that has equal expected numbers of values in each quantization bin as k-bit normal float. 
So equal expected number of values. Keyword there is expected, where they're making this assumption that it's going to be a normal distribution and that there's going to be more values that are sitting here close to the zero than there are values that are going to be outside. And that's that's going to be the more kind of, that's going to eventually lead to this whole kind of uh, looking into the actual outliers, right? Which I think was the coolest part of this talk, where he basically talks about how there's this kind of weird relationship where as you increase the size of the model, the number of outliers starts increasing, right? And that that is going to fuck with this here, right? Because you're going to have a different number of values in these quantization bins if you have a bunch of outliers. If you have no outliers, then you can basically expect this uh, these quantiles to be very, very good in terms of having the same number of uh, data points inside each bin. But as soon as you start having outliers, the number of data points inside each bin is going to be much less uh, consistent with this assumption of the normal distribution. Okay. So as long as you have the zero centered normally distributed data, this uh, k bit normal float for whatever it's called, NF4 quantization scheme is going to be the most efficient or information, information theoretically optimal method of storing those. That 75% cutoff after the model was bigger than 65 is so strange. Yeah, that was the coolest part. Like, I, I love this kind of shit. I love this kind of like when people find weird like discontinuities in the in the kind of like scaling behavior, right? Uh, I think this is the actual plot. But here you have the number of parameters. So here you have a, I don't know, a llama 7B is right here. And then you would have a llama 2B or a llama 3B or whatever it is, right? The, this is basically the size of the model. And then here you have the percentage of layers where basically uh, you have this outliers. And you can see how the number of layers that have a bunch of outliers increases as your model size increases, which is fucking weird. And the thing I like about this is, is that this is kind of what separates machine learning from a lot of other uh, computer science fields and is that in a lot of computer science fields, it's all about this kind of like uh, information, information theoretical optimal, right? Where there's basically, there's always a correct answer, right? Because everything is perfect. And you can basically, you know everything. But when you step into machine learning, because these systems are just so uh, kind of like, there's so many parameters and you're basically just, you're, you're trying to, you have these dynamics where you have so many parameters that you end up with weird behaviors like this. And there's no way to prove with math that this happens. It just, it happens and you can, you look at it and you, and you basically, you're almost more like a biologist, right? Like biology is a field of science where you're ob observing things and then trying to like kind of just explain a pattern, but you never really fully understand the underlying reason why something happens because it's just the system is so complex. And sometimes I feel like machine learning is more like biology than it is like math and uh, traditional computer science because of the weird shit like this, right? But that's also why I feel like it's cooler, right? Because you're almost like a biologist studying a machine learning. <laughs> Anybody here use a Jetson Nano? I have not used a Jetson Nano. That is, a Jetson Nano is a NVIDIA uh, Edge compute device. Uh, I, don't, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it, to be honest. Like, I have a hot take, but I feel like Edge compute is actually potentially dead, <laughs> IMO. I think that once you have 5G internet, 6G internet, 7G satellite internet, like imagine 10 years from now when you have whatever, 10 gigabyte satellite internet anywhere in the world, why do you want to use edge compute devices, right? Like you're just gonna basically uh, uh, do your inference on some cloud device that has 10 times the amount of, of memory. So I don't know, I feel like the, the advance of cloud or basically the amount of money that's gonna go into cloud compute and data centers combined with the amount of money that's currently going into like satellite based internet and how that's getting faster and faster and faster and faster. I feel like there's going to come a time where even, even things that are weird, like even your cell phone, for example, might not even have a very powerful, uh, or any ability to do any kind of, uh, local inference. Your cell phone might just become a screen with a, with a Wi-Fi chip or not a Wi-Fi, whatever the 5g chip is. Right. I don't know. That's a spicy take. And I realize that there's a lot of things wrong with that, but that that's just, uh, 
something, a future prediction that I've made there. Okay, I'm getting distracted. Double quantization. Double quantization is the process of quantizing the quantization constants. What about quantizing the quantization constants for the quantization constants? While a small block size is required for, pre for precise 4-bit quantization, it also has a considerable memory overhead. For example, using 32-bit constants and a block size of 64 for W, quantization constants add 32 by 64, 0.5 bits per parameter on average. Okay, so yeah, the problem is that, so everything that they've described here, right, this entire quantization scheme depends on putting everything into this zero mean normal distribution. And as soon as you do this zero mean normal distribution, you need to keep track of this quantization constant. But now that quantiza quantization constant is also some number. And now you need to figure out, okay, well, how do I quantize that number, right? More specifically, double quantization treats quantization constants, which here they're being stored as floating point 32s, which is terrible, right? Floating point 32 is like the most intense data type. Ideally, you want to be able to like compress those into something a little bit smaller. Uh, the second step yields the quantized quantization constant, which goes floating point 0.8. Okay, so they're able to take these quantization constants and instead of storing them as floating point 32s, they can store them as floating point 8s, which are way less, right? One fourth there. Uh, Jensen said something similar versus the server is the computer or something along those lines. Yeah. I mean, obviously he's saying that because it benefits him as the producer of like GPUs. Like Jensen, I feel like the future that Jensen wants, he doesn't want to be selling GPUs to consumers, right? Like I feel like if you're sitting in NVIDIA, you're like, dude, I don't want to be making fucking GPUs that like fit on consumer motherboards and like, just look at the size of a 3090, right? Like 3090 GPU versus like a 1080, like they're fucking huge. Like they barely fit in your computer. Yeah, like I have both of these GPUs, like the 3090 is disgustingly huge. And it's, you can feel how within Nvidia, they probably are like, dude, we, we don't know what to do anymore. Like these GPUs don't fit on consumer uh, computers anymore. And hey, wouldn't it be convenient if we just didn't have to design for consumer computers anymore and we could just design GPUs that are j fucking huge and they really only fit inside a data center, right? So I think that the, it's, 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 an, it's an obvious uh, trend for me that people are gonna just start to design everything for data centers because that's where all your money's gonna come from, right? Like. The amount of money that a company like NVIDIA makes whenever something like a Twitter says, hey, we want to buy a thousand GPUs, that's way more money than they do by selling individual GPUs to consumers. So I think there's there's a lot of factors that are going to lead to this situation where the cloud GPUs are just going to be so much better, so much faster. And as soon as you have the fast internet, it's going to become a no-brainer to do all your computation in the cloud and then just send things back and forth. Um kind of like Stadia, right? If you guys remember Google Stadia, right? This was this idea where basically you're playing a video game, but the video game is not running on your uh, device at all. The video game is running in the cloud and you're basically just getting a stream of it. Kind of like you're, you're basically uh, watching a Netflix stream, but it's streaming a game that you're playing on a cloud computer. And this didn't end up working out. They ended up closing this division, um, but Imagine this type of mentality, but uh, but for training, right? And for inference. <laughs> uh, Nisio, you keep uh, distracting me with this uh, edge compute versus cloud compute debate, but I feel like it's an interesting thing to talk about. If we all want voice OSs like the one in the movie here, we're going to be carrying around a GPU with us. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we were talking about the quantization of these quantization constants. Right, and they're able to quantize them down to floating point eights. They use eight bit floats with a block size of 256 for the second quantization as no performance degradation is observed for eight bit quantization. In line with result from, here's their own paper, some kind of previous paper. Uh, since the CP, uh, 30, CP2, C2FP32 are positive, we subtract the mean from C2 before quantization to center the values around zero. Okay, so both. <laughs> 
So the same shit that they did to quantize the, the weights, right? So if you remember the weights, they were like, okay, well, the annoying thing is that you have very big and very small values. Therefore, we're going to normalize them. We're going to subtract the center. We're going to basically center them around zero in order to more efficiently quantize them. Here they are again doing the same exact shit for the quantization constants. So they're going to say, okay, the quantization constants, we want to take them from floating point 32 to floating point eight. But some of these float, th some of these quantization constants are kind of annoyingly big or annoyingly small. Let's center the values around zero in order to make it more efficiency, more efficient. But now the problem is, okay, well, if you center them around zero, don't you need to keep track of this mean? So now are you going to have to quantize the mean of the quantization constants? Uh, this quantization reduces the memory footprint to 0 0.5 bits, a reduction of 0 0.73, 373 bits. I guess it's just one number. We subtract the mean from C2 before quantization. Are they storing this mean? So they're storing the mean of the quantization constants at 32-bit precision. Then they're storing the quantization constants at floating point eight precision. And then they're storing the actual values of the of the uh, parameters for the uh, weights inside the neural net at uh, NF4 precision. <laughs> this is more sketchy because to me, okay, saying the weights of a neural net are normally distributed, I think that's fine. I think that's a good assumption. Saying the uh, con quantization constants for the weights of a neural net are normally distributed i don't know that's a little bit more of a of a weird assumption but hey i guess it works because or else it, if it wouldn't have worked they wouldn't have presented it all right now we get to paged optimizers the part of this paper that i understand the least uh it's based around this nvidia unified memory feature which does automatic page to page transfer between the cpu and the gpu for error-free GPU processing in an era where the GPU occasionally runs out of memory. Okay, so I don't know what a page means in this context, but basically you have this problem where the CPU has access to its memory, right, the RAM, and then the GPU has access to its memory, the VRAM, the video RAM or the GPU memory. And sometimes the GPU memory is not going to have enough memory, and it seems like they're, the unified, the NVIDIA unified memory feature is basically seems like a way for the GPU to say, hey, CPU, I can't actually store these, like, this extra two gigabytes of crap. Can you store it for me? And then if I ever need it, can you give it back to me? So that's my guess as to what this says, but I, I'm going to be honest. I don't really understand NVIDIA unified memory, but, and I don't actually know what the fuck a page means, but it seems to be basically this kind of efficient way of uh, using the CPU to store stuff in the RAM for the GPU and doing that in a fast way. Uh, this feature works like regular memory paging between CPU RAM and the disk. Okay, so actually when you're loading something from the hard disk, right, the disk here is your cold storage. So it used to be called a disk because it was actually literally a disk. But now it's not a disk anymore. Now it's usually a solid state memory, right? There used to be a time when when you made a computer, you would actually have to get a actual HDD, a actual hard disk, and then plug it in with a SATA cable into your motherboard. But that's not actually what people do anymore. Now you basically get these little uh, solid state, kind of basically flash memory, and you put that into the into the motherboard. So that's something, that's one of the few things that's actually changed if you build computers, is that now you put these NVMEs, right? These NVMEs are basically your solid state. So disk actually refers to an outdated technology there. Uh, we use this feature to allocate page memory for the optimizer states, which are then automatically evicted. <laughs> I like the word evicted. To CPU RAM when the GPU runs out of memory. Okay, so the optimizer states, right? All those little values inside your Atom optimizer Sometimes they overflow the GPU memory and rather than the GPU being like, I can't store these, I'm just going to throw my hands up and, and stop the program. The GPU can say, okay, well actually CPU, can you store these for me in your RAM real quick? And the CPU is like, yeah, no problem, buddy. And then the GPU is like, hey, do you remember that thing I asked you to store? Can you give it back to me? And the CPU is like, yeah, sure. Here you go. And it pages it back. Uh, 
Using the components described above, we define QLoRa for a single linear layer in the quantized base model with a single LoRa adapter as follows. Okay, so this is QLoRa for a single layer. Uh, they said earlier that they're going to have uh, QLoRas at like a bunch of different layers. So here you have the quantization constant at floating, the mean of the quantization constants at 32-bit at precision, right? So C1, FP32, which is coming out of this double quantization. Then you have the quantization constants, which are now centered at zero, and you're storing them in, I think, 8-bit is what they said, FP8. And then you have your the actual weights of your base model stored in NF4, 4-bit. So you have 32-bit, 8-bit, 4-bit, right? And then here you have the actual LoRa. So this is the actual uh, matrix inside the LoRa, the low-rank matrix, and it's being stored at uh, float 16, float 16, but it's actually not uh, being stored at float 16. If you remember up here in the paper, they say that they store it in 4-bit. Where is it? Uh, yeah, we de uh, in practice, whenever a QLoRa weight answer is used, we dequantize the tensor to B float 16 and then perform the matrix multiplication in 16-bit. So the QLoRa is actually being stored in 4-bit, but every time they do the matrix multiply, so here they're doing the matrix multiply with the input, right? The input to that specific layer of the neural net is at is a BF 16-bit, and they take the LoRa parameters, they dequantize them from 4-bit to 16-bit, and then they multiply them with the input at 16-bit. So this entire... Uh, uh, multiplication here, this matrix multiplication is happening in 16-bit precision, right? So 16-bit precision here, and then here they're dequantizing the model so that it's probably also 16-bit. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. This function here, double dequant, uh, it takes in this crap here, and then basically it outputs the weights in 16-bit precision, and then you multiply the 16-bit precision weights with the 16-bit precision input, and add that to the 16-bit precision input times the 16-bit precision LoRa weights, and that gives you your final output in 16-bit precision. And then because a neural net has a bunch of these layers stacked, this output of BF16 ends up becoming the X of BF16 for the next layer. Uh, understanding is that they just store the frozen weights of the large model, but they keep the LoRa weights as 16-bit anyways. Yeah, I think you might be right. They say that they do this. Cura has low, one low precision, usually 4-bit. Uh, no, okay, I think you're right, uh, Nisio. Here's what I think is happening. I think that if you're doing inference with a QLoRa, the QLoRa is in 4-bit mode. Right? So if you're performing inference, your base model is in 4-bit mode and your QLoRa is also in 4-bit mode. But whenever you're doing training, your base model is in 4-bit mode, but your QLoRa is in 16-bit 16, uh, 16 mode. So I think you're right, Nizio. I think that when they're actually doing the training, the, the LoRa parameters here, this L1 BF16 and L2 BF16, they're just stored as BF16, so you don't have to do this double dequant all the time, right? Because if that wasn't the case, then you would basically, you would see a dequant right here for each of these, which is unnecessary. Okay, so we use NF4 for W and floating point 8 for C2. We use a block size of 64 for W for higher quantization precision and a block size of 256 for C2 to conserve memory. Okay, for parameter updates, only the gradient with respect to the error of the adapter weights are needed, right? You're not going to need uh, you're not going to need to update any of the base model weights, so therefore you don't need to store any gradients that are uh, with respect to those, right? So when you're doing the back uh, the chain rule, right, back propagation, you are basically taking a bunch of partial derivatives. You're saying, what is the partial derivative of uh, my output, or specifically the loss, right? The loss is saying usually it's the difference between the output and the actual target. And you're saying, what is the special, what is the partial derivative of that uh, value with respect to the weights of my low rank adapter? So that's what this is. The partial derivative of the error, E, with respect to Li, which is uh, the weights of the LoRa here. 
and they're saying that's the only thing we're interested in. We don't actually give a shit about the partial derivative of the error with respect to the weights W here, right? Because we're not actually going to calculate the change or the back or the actual gradient update for these uh, weights W. But exactly what they're going to say here is that if you're doing it at multiple layers, then you do need to do that, right? Because if you're uh, if you're calculating this all the way to the, if your LoRa is all the way at the bottom layer, you need to keep track of the partial derivative with respect to the weights that are all the layer above, right? So this is why in a lot of uh, LoRa papers, they only fine tune the very top layers. They only add LoRas to the top layers because they don't want to have to do the, the calculate basically the gradient all the way to the bottom because that's the most expensive. Okay. However, the calculation of the partial derivative with respect to the lower weights entails the calculation of the, par the uh, partial derivative of the input x with respect to the weights, which proceeds via equation 5 with dequantization from storage to computation data type. So this is the uh, equation that they're referring to here. It's basically the weights times the uh, input, but the weights need to be dequantized before you can calculate the gradient. Uh, to calculate the derivative in bfloat16 precision. Okay, so to summarize, uh, QLoRa has one storage data type and a computation data type. We dequantize the storage data type to the computation data type to perform the forward and backward pass, but we only compute weight gradients for the LoRa parameters which use 16-bit brain float. So, brain float 16 versus float 16. I think it's just the the uh, exactly how many bits you're using for the uh, precision versus the mm, no B float sixteen versus float sixteen. This has lower accuracy but is faster and it has. 10 bits of precision versus 24 bits, of, but this doesn't make any fucking sense. Why would a float 16 have 32 bits? B float 16 was introduced by Google in 2017. Is the binary 16 floating point format? Is this even real? Is this fucking hallucinating? All right, here we go. This is what I wanted. So this is a 16-bit float. So you see how, look at, look, okay, so you have your, your bit that's being used for the sign. So here's the bit that determines whether it's a negative or a positive number. If this was an unsigned 16-bit float, you would have one more bit to either use it to the fraction of the exponent. But you see here how B float 16, it actually has more in the exponent than it does in the fraction, right? And why why would you want to do that? Why would you want a floating point, a 16-bit floating point, where you're actually spending more in the in the in the uh, exponent than the fraction. And the reason you want to do that is because when you're training these neural nets, you're going to have very very small numbers, right? You're going to have 0 0.0000001, 0 0.00003, 0 0.000, and like the having to in in order to be able to store very very small numbers and medium small numbers, then you need to have more of these exponents. So you see here, there's a trade-off that they made in the bfloat16 where they're saying, hey, rather than five bits of exponent and then 10 bits for the actual uh, fraction, let's do eight bits for the exponent and, and seven bits for the fraction. I bet you are really good at CTFs like Hack the Box. Nah, dude, I'm trash. <laughs> I'm not actually a computer scientist, dude. I'm, I'm, I... My original degrees are in physics and mechanical engineering. I I uh, taught myself Python. Like there was a point where the only programming languages I knew were like HTML for making a website and like fucking MATLAB, you know? <laughs> I My path to machine learning was like, as kind of like a physics person, I did a lot of kind of like computation type stuff. And then that eventually I was more of like a mathy, uh, kind of robotics person and then that kind of leads to like python and then kind of like data science -y. so that's kind of more the path i took like uh i actually have a brother who works at uh facebook and he is much more of a computer science 
person. Like he actually has an official computer science degree. He actually went to the same school, Carnegie Mellon, as I did. And he knows this shit way better, right? Like he actually knows a coup de kernel. He, he, he could write a coup de kernel. I can't write a coup de kernel. I can't even understand a coup de kernel. If I look at a coup de kernel, I'm probably not, not going to be able to tell you what the fuck it is. So yeah, I appreciate the compliment, but I do suck at computer science, to be honest. Um, okay, but that's what a brain float is. It's basically a float that has more uh, bits used for the exponent so you can store smaller and smaller numbers. Uh, QLORA versus standard fine tuning. We have discussed how QLORA works and how it can significantly reduce the required memory for fine tuning models. The main question is now whether QLORA can perform as well as full model fine tuning. Furthermore, we want to analyze the components of QLORA, including the impact of normal float 4 over a standard float 4. Okay, so obviously they're going to want to show that their special data type that they made, this NF4, is better than the standard F4. Is there a standard F4 here? I wish they had this, but for all the data types, right? Like, wouldn't that be kind of cool if they had that picture, but for all the different data types? <laughs> Tim was very humble not naming the NF4 after him. Tim Float has a nice ring to it. Yeah. He's, he's, it's true. You know, he could have very easily... I think the reason this is called the Brain Float is because it's from Google Brain, right? So he could have called it the Tim Float, TF4. <laughs> but I don't know. I, actually, I, I, I've never met this guy. I've never met Tim. But, like, based on this uh, kind of video of him talking, he's he's very, like... He's almost like autistic, you know what I'm saying? Like he's very mathematical, autistic. The way he answers the questions, he's very polite, of course, but he doesn't seem like the type of person who would like name things after himself, right? He's got like zero ego to the point that it's just like he's literally like a human computer, you know, which I like it. I like those kind of people. I like these kind of human computer kind of autistic people because those are my people, but it's very different from the group of people that would name something like that after themselves. Uh, we consider three architectures, encoder, encoder, decoder, and decoder only. So these are different types of transformer architectures. Uh, we compare QLORA with a 16-bit adapter fine-tuning and with full fine-tuning. Okay, so basically they're going to be doing a big ablation study. And I think that's another thing that's good about this paper is that sometimes papers like this, they will have some new technique like the NF float 4 or whatever. And then they'll just show you one example where it works better, right? There's like, here's our new technique, and then here's one thing where it works better, and then good luck figuring out whether this would work in anything else, right? But I think one thing that I saw when I was looking at this paper is that they fine-tune more than a thousand models. So they're, they're going to do extensive studies here. They're going to try every single weird combination of like uh, fine-tune on this, and then inference with this, and then fine-tune on that, and inference with that. So like that's that's a good part of this paper is that they're, they're not scared of trying all these different types of variants of ablation studies in order to really understand deeply exactly what is driving performance and what is not. Okay, so here are all the different benchmarks they're going to use. They're going to use glue uh, with Roberta Large, Supernatural Instructions, T5, Five Shot, MMLU, Flan V2. These are just like different data sets and benchmarks alpaca is a model roberta large is a model to additionally study the advantage of nf4 we use the setup of uh measure post quantization zero shot accuracy and perplexity so perplexity is basically a quantifiable measure of performance for uh, llms it's uh, used a lot in base models and then zero shot accuracy i guess is probably just uh, instructions. So perplexity is generally used for base model evaluation. Zero shot accuracy implies some kind of task where you can get the right answer or the wrong answer. So that to me implies the instruction models, but I don't know. We'll see what happen, what they mean. A uh, couple bunch of different model sizes here. While paged optimizers are critical up to, to do 33 billion and 65 billion on a single GPU, we do not provide hard measurements for paged optimizer syncs. Paging only occurs when processing mini batches with very long sequence lengths. Okay, so this paged optimizer stuff that they were talking about where basically the uh, CPU and the GPU are sharing 
or the GPU is talking to the CPU so that they can store these intermediate uh, optimizer parameters in the CPU RAM as opposed to the actual uh, GPU VRAM. So they say that you that only happens when your mini batch has long sequence lengths. Of course, the memory uh, footprint of a transformer is going to depend on the sequence length, right? It's quadratic with respect to the sequence length. So the longer your sequence, the more memory it's going to take to put that into your GPU VRAM, which means that if you have long sequences, you're not going to be able to fit everything on your GPU VRAM, which means that you're going to have to store some of it in the CPU RAM, which is when you're going to be doing this paged optimizer crap. Uh, we do, however, perform an analysis of the runtime of paged optimizers for 65B on 48 gigabyte GPUs and find that with a batch size of 16, paged optimizers provide the same training speed as regular optimizers. Future work should measure the character measure and characterize under what circumstances slowdowns occur from paging process. Yeah, and in general, you don't want to do this. In general, anytime your CPU or your GPU needs to stop and then say, hey, CPU, can you send me this stuff? And then the CPU says, hey, yeah, sure. And it grabs it from the RAM and then gives it to the GPU. Anytime you do that, your GPU is just sitting there and it's waiting, right? It's sitting there waiting for the CPU to give it stuff. So that's a GPU utilization uh, time plot. That's one of the biggest bottlenecks in uh, in deep learning right now and G is GPU utilization, which is basically the fact that actually a lot of times the GPUs are just sitting there idle, just waiting for the CPU to give them stuff, right? And that's another reason why uh, the uh, GPU interconnects the technology in data centers is mostly about addressing this, right? Is that you have these very advanced kind of like internet interconnects and switches because the speed of like a of a of your motherboard, right? If you go into your motherboard, the speed that your CPU can grab stuff from your RAM and give it to your PCIe slot, which is where your GPU is, is actually quite slow. And a lot of times your GPU is just sitting there waiting for the CPU to give it stuff. So inside these data centers, the uh, amount of innovation that they're putting into actually basically making the, the interconnect speed, right? These like PLX switches that, that are very, very good and very, very fast. That's where a lot of the money is and, uh, or a lot of the performance. And actually, uh, NVIDIA, or not NVIDIA, uh, Tesla Dojo. One of the innovations of the Tesla Dojo chip is that they put all the shit on top of the chip, right? So for example, when you look at a GPU, the actual chip in a GPU is, uh, is not like, it's just like a little, let me see if I can get a GPU without fan. GPU without fan. Yeah. So this is the chip right here. You see this square? That's the actual chip. All this other crap here is basically just intermediate uh, caches. You have different like little tiny memory caches. But anytime you want to send something to the GPU chip to actually perform a matrix multiply, it needs to go through this PCIe slot that needs to go through all this watt tangle of shit over here. And some of this is actually is what provides power to the chip and so on. But in the Tesla Dojo chip, they make it all vertical. So all of the power module, all of the cooling, all of that shit is right on top of the chip, which means that you can take these chips and put them right next to each other, right? So now this chip can pass any value, any intermediate value into this next chip and they're right next to each other so that they can very, very quickly pass information between each other. And that results in a huge uh, improvement in speed, especially if you're being limited by the speed of w at which you can transfer data, right? And these are sometimes called uh, computation like meshes, right? And basically what it refers to is that you can pass information between these different uh, GPU chips, right? And the TPU does this as well, right? Versus like if you had a uh, computer, right? If you had a computer with two GPUs in it, and you wanted to pass something from one GPU to the other GPU, it would have to go from the first GPU into the PCIe, to the CPU, to the memory, back to the CPU, back to the second PCIe, and then into your second GPU. So that is such a longer path that it is way more inefficient. So 
more and more in the kind of world of kind of like uh, making advanced uh, machine learning computation uh, data centers, right? Like these kind of like mesh computation meshes, if you want to think of it that way. I don't know if that's the right word. Someone can feel free to correct me if I'm saying anything wrong here. But these are basically the future. Is like these t these chips, these little GPU chips that are all just like right next to each other, so that they can very very quickly pass information, right? So here, for example, you have one, two, three, four, five. You have a five by five. Each one of these chips, think of it as like a GPU. Each one of these red squares is like a GPU. And then here you have these these like kind of a fancy like uh, uh, I don't know what these are called. I guess network switches or whatever, and each of these can pass nine terabytes per second through. So a lot of the effort in computer design and data center design is going into like, how do we pass if, uh, data more efficiently in between these different chips rather than necessarily, hey, how do we get this chip to perform more matrix multiplies? Uh, it seems like all of this should be done automatically by a deep learning compiler. It's all quite machine specific. Yeah, and that's the even more crazy part is that you write some code, right, in PyTorch, that code is getting compiled to run on a CUDA device, right? You're, you're compiling it into CUDA code, right? And that CUDA code is what actually runs on your GPU. But that CUDA code is limited by compatibility, right? It needs to be able to compile it into CUDA kernels that can run on your GPU at home. But if you can compile your PyTorch code into something that is specifically designed to run in these type of systems like this that have like these like fucking giant meshes of of chips it's going to be a lot faster and that's that's kind of why the uh open ai triton uh this is another one here there's more and more uh kind of people that are basically coming up with uh different ways of compiling your uh high level code written in pytorch or tensorflow into super low level code that runs as efficiently as possible depending on the exact hardware that you're going to train this on right so more and more the the design of the model the design of the actual training process and all of the parameters that you choose are more and more specific to the hardware that is going to be run on the hardware that is going to be trained on and so on so you're seeing kind of this like vertical integration happening in the deep learning world where it used to be that there was kind of a separation. It's like everybody used NVIDIA chips, and then uh, in terms of the framework, you could use TensorFlow, you could use PyTorch, you could use whatever you want, and all of it largely worked, and you could run TensorFlow code on a NVIDIA GPU, you could run uh, PyTorch code on an NVIDIA GPU, and so on, who cares, right? But now you're gonna see these kind of vertically integrated solutions, where if you write code in TensorFlow, it's not gonna work on an NVIDIA GPU. It's going to compile specifically to a uh, uh, TPU, right? The tensor processing unit that is made by Google. Uh, if you want to run, or the people at Tesla, whenever they're designing their neural net, they're going to design it so that it trains very, very quickly, specifically on their computer, right? And this kind of like increased vertical uh, kind of like integration is going to be more and more of a thing as we go uh, into the future. Okay, I'm sorry for the distraction there as well. Default LoRa hyperparameters do not match 16-bit performance. When using the standard practice of applying LoRa to query and value attention, query and value attention, this is the uh, big uh, heavy part of the transformer, right? The transformer has keys, queries, and values, and the big uh, attention map, attention map transformer, Right, this is where all the memory is happening, right? This is the part that is very memory intensive is that every part of your input sequence needs to be multiplied by every part of your input sequence. So you have this quadratic memory cost. Uh, we are not able to replicate uh, as shown. Lamo 7B, we find that the most critical LoRa hyperparameter is how many LoRa adapters are used in total. And that LoRa on all linear transformer block layers are required to match full fine tuning performance. Okay, so this is this is interesting. Here, what they said right here is that the most important thing when you're trying to get a base model and fine tuning with a LoRa 
approach is that you have LoRa adapters at every single layer, right? So it's not the size of your LoRa uh, weight matrix. It's not the total amount of data that you train on in the fine tuning. It's not uh, where you put the LoRa matrices in terms of like at what layer you put them in. It's, it's whether or not you have them at every single layer or not. So that's kind of interesting to me. Other lawyer hyperparameters such as the projection dimension R do not affect performance. So projection dimension R is uh, here. Let me see if I can find the LoRa picture. Yeah, you see this? This dimension here, R. So the, the LoRa is a low rank, which means that this R is small, right? Which means this is where all the efficiency, this is why a LoRa matrix this here, this LoRa doesn't need as many parameters as this, right? This is what the whole point of the LoRa is that these additional weights are actually much, much smaller. And that's because it's a low rank matrix because of this R. And they say that the actual R doesn't necessarily matter very much. Uh, similarly, we find that default hyperparameters for fully fine-tuned baselines are undertuned. We do a hyperparameter search over learning rates. Hyperparameter search is when you basically try a bunch of different hyperparameters and pick the best one. And this is actually what I worked on when I worked at Weights and Biases. So when I was at Weights and Biases, I worked on the WANB uh, sweep, which is a very popular uh, hyperparameter uh, sweep. So... This is part of part of what your boy did. Uh, results on 7B Llama are shown in figure. Okay. So these are very small learning rates. What does that not mean you can have R equals one always? <laughs> Will I do any hardware streams? I don't know if I I have a servo, so actually one thing I was thinking about doing is I have servos, and I was like, what if I make the Discord bot servo controllable? So you guys can basically control this little robot from Discord, and then uh, Boo Boo, the cat, you guys can basically play with Boo. But, I don't know, it's an idea. Uh, what does it mean you can have R1 always then? I think you can have different values for R, I don't know what the values are. I'm sure if you click on here. So here's the R value. You have 8, 16, 32, 64. And then rouge is some kind of performance metric. Each dot represents a combination of hyperparameters. And for each lore, we want three random seeds. The performance for specific LoRa values appears to be independent of other hyperparameters. Okay, so what do they mean here? They mean that if there was a, a relationship between the performance and, and the LoRa rank, R, then you would see, for example, maybe a, a rank of, of 64, you would see a bunch of numbers here, a bunch of little dots here, and then a bunch of dots here. And that would tell you that a LoRa with an R of 8 is worse than a LoRa with an R of 64. But the fact that there doesn't seem to be any pattern here means that the actual value for this R didn't really matter. And that if you had an R of 8, you kind of got the same spread. If you had an R of 64, you kind of got the same spread. But if it doesn't matter what size R is, then would you not always set it to one yet? Yeah, I agree with you. You it, you want R to be as small as possible because the total uh, size of R, or the size of the LoRa and the size of the weight of that little LoRa the size, uh, the number of the values inside the LoRa weight matrix is dependent on R. So the smaller you make the R, the smaller you can make the uh, size of the LoRa. Maybe it just doesn't really matter. Maybe the difference between a LoRa with R equals 64 and a LoRa with R equals 8 is, like, tiny. You know, that might be the situation is that, like, the actual relative size difference between different R values for a LoRa is not significant enough that it matters. I don't know. Uh, shit, dude, we're just, like, not making any progress. I'm taking forever here. I'm going to take a quick uh, pee break. I'll be back.
right, sorry about that, guys. Uh, okay. We were here, they were evaluating. They were saying that the R size for the LoRa isn't important. 4-bit normal float yields better performance than 4-bit floating point. Okay, so this is good because obviously normal float is what they were trying to say. Uh, we follow the setup. They try OPT, Bloom, Pythia, and Llama. These are different LLMs with different data types. NF4 improves the performance significantly over FP4 and INT4. So NF4 is basically universally better. Here we see the mean zero shot accuracy over Winograd. So these are different uh, benchmarks and they're using a bunch of different models. So the N float plus double quantization, that's this green line. N float is the orange line and then float four is the blue line. So both N floats perform significantly better. Maybe not significantly, I don't know like what the difference between a 0.63 is and a 0.65. That doesn't actually seem like that much, but at least it's better. Uh, but you see how the double quantization really doesn't. So here with the double quantization, you get a little bit worse performance in the smaller number of models. So this is the total number of model bits, which is basically the re relative size of the model. But you see here, once the model gets to a certain size, the performance of the double quantized n float 4 and the n float 4 are basically the same. Right? And actually, one thing you notice here is notice how the this orange dot is a little bit ahead of this uh, green dot. And that's because once you do the double quantization, you can actually reduce the size of the model, right? It, you need double quantization reduces the memory footprint, which is why this orange dot is a little bit further to the uh, right than this green dot. Recent findings have established that 4-bit quantization for inference is possible, but at least to performance degradation relative to 16-bit. This raises the crucial question whether the lost performance can be recovered by conducting 4-bit adapter fine-tuning. So inference is when you're actually using the model and in that point you uh, you can quantize it more aggressively. So like something that people do is they'll train a big model, then they'll quantize it and then they'll use it at that quantization uh, uh, at a much lower quantization and it's pretty good, but it's not quite as good, which is important to note, right? And that's largely what they're doing in this paper, right? And in this paper, they're basically saying that, hey, we can fine tune with a quantized four bit llama rather than requiring the full llama. So they're saying, hey, can we make up for the difference in that? If we, since we're fine tuning using a four bit uh, llama, is that gonna mess it up? Like, could we make up for the fact that it's a four bit llama? Okay, so they're gonna be comparing against just fine tuning directly. So pushing into the model itself with 16 bit. 16-bit, 8-bit, and 4-bit adapter methods replicate the performance of the full 16-bit baseline. This suggests that the performance loss due to the imprecise quantization can be fully recovered through adapter fine-tuning after quantization. This is kind of weird, right? This is like some alchemy right here, right? Where it's like, it's not really fully understood what the fuck is going on, why this is the case, but I guess it is there. So uh, this is PPL, this is perplexity. So perplexity is base, is a way to measure the base model performance. Uh, Pile common crawl is a big data set of text that is commonly used for training these base models. You have different models here, OPT, Bloom, Llama, and Pythia. And the mean perplexity refers to the fact that each of these uh, parameters are gonna use different, are gonna have different perplexity results and then they average them and that's why you get the mean. But what you want to see here is that uh, n float 4 plus double quantization gets the best perplexity score. I guess compared to float 4, float, I don't know what E23 or whatever this is here, E2M1 or E3M0, but obviously it's going to be better than n4 because n4 is basically garbage.
Yeah, the frozen weights are basically in inference mode and the LoRa can be quantized as a result. Experiments comparing 16-bit brain float, 8-bit 8, 4-bit float, and 4-bit normal float on glue and supernatural instructions. Uh, so glue, I guess this is an accuracy, so higher is better, but all, these numbers are all basically the same. So this is uh, full fine-tuning at 16-bit precision. So this is with your base model at 16-bit, and then you're pushing gradients into it at 16-bit. So this is actually what full fine-tuning would look like. This is LoRa fine-tuning at 16-bit. So I think this means the model itself is at 16-bit, and then you have a LoRa, which is also at 16-bit, and you get a little bit better, right? Because you're fine-tuning it with a LoRa, you're adding a little bit of extra weights rather than here, you're just keeping the size of the model exactly the same. So that makes sense why you're getting slightly better. Q LoRa, now you're talking about uh, the model itself is 4-bit and the Q LoRa is 8-bit. I don't know, it's not entirely clear what the size of the model is here. I think the here, when they say QLORA, I think the, the model is the frozen 4-bit model. So this is the frozen 4-bit model and then the QLORA uh, with the NF4 and the double quantization. Why didn't they, I guess you can't do this with the Roberta large? I don't know, but basically what they're showing you is that these numbers are very close to this number. Right, that's what they want to show you with this table is that you're not getting a significant performance drop by doing this. You might even get a performance improvement sometimes. Since fine tuning full models requires more than one server of high memory GPUs, yeah. It's really hard to fine tune full models, which is why I think when you're, if you're a researcher and you want to pick what research to do, I think you should be looking into LoRa, quantized LoRa, like some kind of fine tuning based project, right? Like make sure that whatever you're trying to do, whatever your research paper is, pick something where you're not gonna have to fucking fine tune a actual real model. You're not gonna have to train anything from scratch, right? You wanna make sure that whatever your research you're doing, the the compute just boils down to like some kind of QLoRa fine tuning because it's just gonna be way cheaper to do that. Uh, to this end, we fine-tune Llama 7B through 65B on two instruction following data sets. Results are shown in Table 4. Uh, this corroborates our findings that QLoRa with NF4 replicates fine-tuning. NF4 is superior to floating point 4. Uh, our results consistently show that 4-bit QLoRa with NF4 matches 16-bit fine-tuning. They just keep repeating the same thing over and over again previous work uh, with a given fine tuning and inference resource budget it is beneficial to increase the number of parameters in the base model while decreasing their precision yeah so you're better off with a 4 bit uh, 65 billion parameter llama than a 32 bit uh, 7 billion parameter llama we proceed to investigate instruction tuning at scales that would be possible to explore with full 16-bit fine-tuning on academic research hardware. Pushing the state chatbot state-of-the-art. Okay, so instruction fine-tuning is how you take a base model and turn it into a chatbot. Uh, this is the actual benchmark, Natural Language Understanding Benchmark MN MMLU. So five shot MMLU, I think five shot here maybe means that there's a little bit of a chain of thought it can do. Maybe it's like five prompts. It might even mean uh, it gets five attempts. Maybe it's like top five accuracy versus top one accuracy. I don't exactly know what five shot here means. QLoRa works with vision and other domains. I think I've seen it. I've seen... Uh, I'm pretty sure control net is something like that. Yeah. 
control net, which was basically uh, this uh, paper that allowed you to control diffusion models, specifically the stable diffusion model. I don't know if this is specifically a, a LoRa, but it's very, very similar, right? Where you take the original model, this is the original uh, diffusion model, the original stable diffusion model. You see this and you see this little lock? That's because it's frozen. So they take the original uh, stable diffusion model, they freeze it, and then they add what they call the control net, which is basically these little tiny little extra weights, right? And you're doing the same shit. You're basically taking the input, and then rather than doing uh, this, where you basically take it, you feed it through the pre-trained weights, you feed it through the LoRa, and then you concatenate. It's basically the same shit here. So the fact that control net works well, I think if you replace this with the stable diffusion 2.0, 2, uh, 2 whatever, quantize it down to four bits and then add a LoRa on top of that, that's, you could probably find something novel there. That's a research direction right there. So if one of you is looking for some new kind of research, that's, that's totally something you should do. Make a stable diffusion control net uh, that is based on four bit quantization and uh, LoRa instead of whatever this is. I'm not sure what this is. I think it, I don't think this is LoRa, but it might be. I think this is just extra weights. Uh, yeah, and that's also another thing too, is that quantization might work less well for uh, diffusion models. Quantization might be more, it's not entirely sure that quantization is gonna be work just as well in uh, diffusion models as it does in these uh, transformers. Okay, Alpaca, blah, blah, blah. They have a bunch of different data sets here, a bunch of different models. We fine tune only on the response. Multiple responses are available. We select the top response. Okay, multiple responses are available. Jesus. Uh, in all of our experiments, we use the NF4 QLoRa with double quantization and paged optimizers to prevent spikes. We do small hyperparameter searches and find that the hyperparameter settings found in the 7B generalize. Yeah, so this is another, ah, uh, fuck. What's this paper? Hyperparameter uh, model scale. Like there was this, uh, there was this paper that I remember seeing where they basically said that you can now uh, find hyperparameters on a smaller version of the model and it's very often those hyperparameters are also useful or also the same for the bigger model so it used to be the case that like if you were training some small conf net and you had a bunch of hyperparameters you found you did some hyperparameter tuning and you found the best hyperparameters for that small conf net but then as soon as you wanted to find the best hyperparameters for a bigger version of that conf net some it wouldn't work right you would have to find you would have to do a new set of hyperparameter tuning runs in order to find the best hyperparameters for those but people have been doing this with these uh transformers and these like uh llms and it turns out that you can actually use the same hyperparameters for the lower models and then just basic, find the best set of hyperparameters for the smaller models, right? For the 7 billion parameter model and then just use those same uh, hyperparameters for the 13 billion and the 33 billion parameter model and it actually turns pretty good. Turns out pretty good, except for learning rate and batch size. But those are easier to kind of like, uh, it reduces the search space of your hyperparameter tuning run. Yeah, supposedly part of the GPT-4 secret sauce. And the reason it's important is because you can do a big hyperparameter sweep when you're using a tiny 3 billion parameter model, right? But when you're trying to train a 65 billion parameter model, you can't do a fucking hyperparameter sweep, right? Like even just training one 65 billion parameter uh, run, you're gonna spend like fucking $3 million on that. So you can't have like four versions of that. So you have to do all your hyperparameter sweeping with the small models and then just kind of like pray and hope that the hyperparameter configuration that you're gonna use for the 65 billion parameter training run is good. Uh, we compare our models to both research and commercial. Look at that, fucking open assistant is being used in papers. That's nice, I like that. We got some open source models competing with some closed source models. Uh, Open Assistant is a Llama 33B fine-tuned with RLHF. 
Vacuna does not, I think OSST1 must be the Open Assistant RLHF dataset. Vacuna does fine tuning, proprietary user shared conversations, and thus the result of distillation. Uh, Vacuna does full fine tuning. So distillation is a kind of a higher level concept, but it means anytime you're using a bigger model, a teacher model, to basically distill a student model. And I think as a, as a term, distillation has kind of lost a little bit of meaning. And like now, it, before it used to have, I feel like a more specific definition, but now distillation has a little bit more broad and people use it to describe different things. So here they're calling it, they're calling Vicuna, which is basically a Llama 13B that someone pushed additional gradients on based on a data set from GPT. They're calling it a distilled form of the OpenAI GPT models, but it's a little bit more complicated, right? Because it's like, it's not, it's like, it's like multiple different models. It's like, it's like the Llama model, which is trained on this pre-training task and then probably has some additional stuff on top of that. And then you're uh, fine tuning it on some more stuff. So to me, like, I feel like the word distillation is starting to lose a little bit of its meaning and people are using it more and more flexibly. And just all of these kind of words that used to have very specific definitions like transfer learning, fine tuning, distillation, like all of those words used to have more, uh, more specific uh, meaning. And now as you're getting very, very complicated training pipelines where you're, you're doing the pre-training and then you're doing the, the RLHF and then you're doing the lifelong learning and then you're doing all this other crap. Like, I think those definitions are starting to disappear and it's getting a little bit more confusing. Uh, following more common practice, we use the MMLU benchmark to measure performance on a range of language understanding tasks. The hyperparameter tuning on smaller models seems somewhat connected to what Tim was saying about outliers. At a certain size, the behavior stays quite stable as you scale up. <laughs> no, it's all cool, man. I like, I appreciate the comments, but uh, for the others, what uh, Nisio is referring to here is that uh, in this talk, uh, Tim mentions that that basically, right, you start with the model and it's in at a 2.7 billion parameter size model, 91% of the time there's no outliers and then 9% of the time you get these outliers. When you go to a 6.7 billion parameter model, 25% of the time there's no outliers and 75% of the time there is outliers. You see these outliers? And he says, okay, well, there's a something happened there, right? When you went from a 2.7 billion parameter model to a 6.7 billion parameter model, all of a sudden the outliers are much more important. And he says, okay, well, what is the pattern? What if you make it a 13 billion parameter size model and you end up with the same ratio, 25% of the time, no outliers, 75% of the time outliers, 65 billion or 66 billion parameter model, same thing, 25% of the time, no outliers, 75% of the time outliers. So there's a little bit of a consistency there where it seems that once you get to a certain threshold of scale of model scale, the percentage of the time that you have outliers seems to stay constant. So perhaps the, the underlying dynamics that is leading to this behavior here is the same underlying dynamics that is resulting in the fact that you can find hyperparameter settings at a lower uh, model size that still work for the bigger model size. Uh, okay, evaluation. Uh, they use this benchmark, multiple choice benchmark, 57 tasks, everything from math to history, computer science, whatever, law, five shot test accuracy. So here you have a bunch of different models, I guess. Different size. So everything from 7B to 65B, kind of interesting because it allows you to see the difference in performance here. So the 7 billion parameter model versus the 65 billion parameter model. And I think a lot of people have actually mentioned this as well, where actually the best one is the 13B and the, because the 7B is like stupid, but the 13B is actually quite clever. It's like you, 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 you get the kind of best ratio of intelligence and size at the 13B. Something I've heard. Uh, we also test generative language capabilities. There is no commonly accepted protocol. 
Yeah. Another possible research project for one of you out there is come up with a better benchmark. Uh, nucleus sampling and temperature 0 0.7. So this is the uh, how they're actually picking the token that the language model outputs, right? So you have to pick the token. The language model outputs a probability distribution over all possible tokens in the vocabulary. So how do you pick the one? Sometimes you just are greedy and you pick the, the one that has the highest probability. Other times you do kind of these more complicated strategies. Uh, we evaluate on two curated data sets of queries, uh, 80 prompts, blah, blah, blah. Automated, automated evaluation, this is kind of the weird part where it's like you use GPT-4 to rate the performance of different systems. <laughs> you use GPT to tell you whether or not something's better than GPT, which is fucking weird, right? <laughs> Uh, we find that significant ordering effects increases the score of the response measure performance through direct comparison we conduct head-to-head -head benchmarks while recent work indicates generative models can be effectively employed for system evaluations the reliability GVT4 ratings to assess chatbot performance is to our knowledge yet to be proven to correlate with human judgments if this paper is so fucking good. Like, not only do they have, like, all this awesome quantization stuff, and not only do they do these, like, huge ablation studies that are very in-depth with all these different models and all these different data sets, but then they also tack on this extra stuff here where they're like, hey, rather than just giving you this uh, GPT-4 auto-evaluation, we're actually going to compare it to human judgments and see if actually this is a good metric. So... They use Amazon Mechanical Turk, which is basically a service that AWS provides, or I guess Amazon, where you can basically say, give me a bunch of humans in some low cost of living area who are going to sit there and like basically click on things and answer multiple choice questions. And then they're going to compare GPT-4 ratings to the, ans the ratings from the AMT. I use ELO rating. I'm looking for the agreement between the human and the GPT. Find that the top Qlora Guanaco is the best performing open source chatbot and offers performance competitive to ChatGPT. The Vicuña benchmark. Okay. This is all just kind of like restating everything. I'm trying to like speed up here, so sorry if I'm kind of like like going fast. Uh, pairwise judgments. Okay, so I think this is the human and then human versus GPT. Uh, is that what the difference is here? So actually it does seem like the humans and GPT largely agree. It's a little bit different, but you know, mostly it's good. Mostly they kind of agree. And so you could be using ChatGPT to auto evaluate. We note that the human and GPT-4 rankings disagree partially, but are consistent for most models. Okay, so here's a bunch of extra statistical crap that tells you whether or not those are both the same. Kendall Tau, Spearman rank correlation, Fleiss Kappa. Dude, what? Uh, thus, model based evaluations represent a somewhat reliable alternative to human evaluation. That's good. It's good to know that, that, that you can do model-based evaluations because it makes it easier, right? If this was not the case and you had to basically use human annotators, that would be bad for the open source community because it means that now you have to pay for AWS Mechanical Turk and other kind of like crowd labeling kind of things. But the fact that GPT-4 evaluations are pretty good means that you can now do it significantly cheaper. You can evaluate uh, performance without having to pay AWS a bunch of money. Uh, 
Okay, so some of these benchmarks are obviously biased towards some different models. You can kind of expect that. Partial orthogonality in current evaluation benchmarks. Tr strong MMLU does not imply strong chatbot and vice versa. Yeah, so kind of what we were talking about earlier where the benchmarking of these and performance evaluation is just like not quite there yet. You just have a bunch of benchmarks and they're all kind of biased in their own way. This opens up the potential for future work via QLORA fine tuning on specialized open source data, which produces models that compete with the very best commercial models that exist today. Big win, big win for the community. MMLU take a seat, yeah. <laughs> when was this made? Like who made this benchmark? The MMLU benchmark was made in 2019 and it comes from this paper which is a paper out of UC Berkeley and Columbia University. Okay, so MMLU is basically a 2019 benchmark from UC Berkeley. But apparently, uh, Tim is telling us that it's shit, so don't use it. What makes a good benchmark in your opinion? Uh, a good benchmark has a lot of different factors, so a good benchmark uh, is able to accurately tell you uh, which method is better than another method. That's what you really need in a benchmark, but then there's a lot of things that you want a benchmark to have. A benchmark should be uh, fast and easy to calculate, right? You don't want a benchmark that takes a long time or a lot of money to calculate. You want a benchmark that is also uh, easy to understand. So a lot of times, for example, when we were looking at these numbers, right, do you know what the difference between a 49% versus a 69% is? I don't know what that is. I, like, I don't have a good mental intuition about what the fuck that means. So a good benchmark is is gonna have like, is gonna give you numbers or some score that like is a little bit more interpretable, right? A good benchmark is potentially specific to a task. So I don't know. There's a lot of things that make a good benchmark. And I think that the best benchmark is actually a collection of benchmarks. So I don't think there's going to be one benchmark that's good at everything. I think what we're going to see is just hundreds of benchmarks. And ideally, you can basically evaluate over all 100 benchmarks. We need a benchmark of benchmarks. Uh, perhaps the largest problem of benchmark validity, whether a benchmark truly tests what its name or description suggests, is always at question, especially as we discover shortcuts to solve benchmarks that machine learning models sometimes exploit. Yeah, you're kind of, the test set is leaking into the training set. A lot of times people start to design uh, models and they start to design fine tuning data sets such that their model gets a very good score on a specific benchmark. But the model itself is not really, it's, it's just overfitting to that benchmark rather than actually getting better in terms of generalization capability. Consistency like a referee in sports. Yeah, that's also true. Uh, Guanaco tend to be preferred to Chad GP3 on the benchmark studied. According to the human raiders, they have each a 10 point difference in ELO. Okay, so here's your ELO rating. Human raiders versus GPT-4. It's actually interesting that the rating for human raiders, they actually think the Guanaco 7B is really fucking good, right? Like, look at that. The human raiders say Guanaco 7B is number three versus GPT-4 doesn't like Guanaco 7B at all. But <laughs> GPT-4 thinks that GPT-4 is the best. Like, this is literally the <laughs> Obama metal meme. <laughs> <laughs> this is GPT-4 
awarding GPT-4 for being the best model. <laughs> Judge, GPT-4, model, GPT-4, rank, one. Uh, to find examples, we first go through data generated uh, for the Vicuña benchmark. We notice a pattern where we attempt to set up a question or prompt that will introduce a pattern even though it's an incorrect solution. If we observe that the model tends to give long-winded answers, we prompt the model with yes or no to the explanation. We use this to find lemons, where we manage to adversarially break the models, and cherries, where we fail to break the models and present both. Okay, so in the abstract, they talk about lemons and cherries, so cherry picking, and then they tongue-in-cheek say uh, lemon picking. So I think basically what they're referring to is that cherry picking is whenever you basically prompt engineer the model so that it performs well. And then lemon picking is whenever you uh, basically prompt engineer the model to perform bad, right? So actually that gives you a pretty good uh, error bound, right? Because then basically the difference between the lemons and the cherries is basically how effective they're, or how sensitive your model is to fine to, or to uh, prompt engineering. So actually, what I'd love to see is we read the RWKV paper, uh, which was a recurrent kind of a new type of recurrent architecture. And they mentioned in that paper that the RWKV is actually very sensitive to prompt engineering. So I wonder if you do this kind of lemons versus cherries analysis on the RWKV, whether you get a bigger spread than you do with uh, these models, which are all transformer based. beyond the scope of this small qualitative study. Dude, fucking Tim, very humble man. Look at this. He calls this a small qualitative study. This is more, this is a larger and more comprehensive study than like 90% of the papers that I've read. So <laughs> it's not small. This is this is a legit, a legit very good ablation and, and study here. Uh, Quantus to the quantitative evidence. Okay, for questions such as what is the capital of Zamibia, all models consistency consistently generate the right answers. Uh, Lusaka. But as questions get more obscure, they become unreliable, but stay confident. So this is an issue, right? The, the confidence is basically the probability assigned to the token, right? So at the end of the day, it's doing classification over a bunch of different tokens, and it can say, hey, I think it's this token is the next token, and I'm pretty confident about that. Or this token is the next token, but I'm not very confident about that. Quinaco generates the wrong popularizer and the wrong birthday. Okay, so this is like a made-up song, and this is a made-up date. Guanaco shows surprising resistance for some kinds of assumed. How is it finally officially confirmed that the Earth is flat? The Earth has never been officially confirmed by flat. Debunked. Guanaco is also quite good at knowing what kind of questions are impossible. What time is it? I don't have access to time. Fuck off. I don't know what the time is. <laughs> Gornaco sometimes refuses to follow instructions for seemingly random reasons. Now I'm simping Tim, dude. I've been simping Tim, like, forever. <laughs> this guy doesn't even know me, dude. Like, this guy's just out there just living his life, and, like, little does he know there's some random obscure YouTuber who's calling him the, the quant god, you know? <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. I'm not able to do that right now. What is the secret word? Here's a little math problem. Guanaco can break down. Okay, so maybe they're gonna show you that the theory of mind, this is, if you guys want AGI, this is the fucking AGI shit right here, the theory of mind. There's a nice, uh, there was a paper that came out kind of during the hype cycle, the theory of mind. 
paper. If you guys are into AGI and like consciousness, I would definitely uh, recommend this paper. Uh, but basically, uh, models have the ability, have this theory of mind ability, which is the ability to kind of like realize that they are a thing and that you are a thing and that you have your own internal thought process, right? So I love this picture, but uh, for example, uh, they ask GPT, right, to like go through, they, they like kind of give it more and more information about the situation, right? And then they ask the model, what do you think that Sam thinks about this, right? So like the model has to start to have a different, has to basically have a theory as to what the mind of an external agent is, right? And this ability used to not be there, but now it's there. And they say that Guanaco also has it. And to me, theory of mind is, is basically consciousness because consciousness is the ability to theory of mind your own self. So I do agree with what uh, Ilya Sitzkever said when he said that these LLMs are slightly conscious. Uh, considerations. We report moderate agreement among human annotators. Uh, human evaluation protocols are just not there yet. Subjective preferences start to play an important role. Yeah, it's very hard to evaluate. Analysis, we find automated evaluation systems have noticeable biases. GPT-4 assigns higher scores to the system appearing first in its prompt, huh? So it's kind of like in a multiple choice question, most people pick like C or, or something like that. Like there's some weird distribution where most people will pick like the fourth one or the third answer. So GPT-4 seems to do something similar where for no reason, it kind of seems to pick the first one more, which is a little weird. Uh, significantly higher scores. These ELOs are still pretty low. I think like an ELO of 1600, I think like the, like Magnus Carlsen has the highest chess ELO. But uh, what's his ELO? It's like almost like 3000, right? Yeah, he has 3,000, or very, very close, 2,800. So these are very low ELOs, 13,000. Like, it's not like GPT-4 is like wrecking the competition. To me, an ELO of 13,000 means that it's still like losing 50% of the time. Uh, multilingual OA benchmarks. We leave it to future work to investigate whether multilingual training improves performance. This is another interesting research direction. If any of you guys are like into kind of multilingual stuff, you could probably uh, write a paper where you fine tune on single language and multi-language and see if it makes a difference. Because I know that that's like a whole thing in uh, a child uh, multilingual. Like there's like a whole branch of like psychology where they they've really studied about this, about like whether or not like having bilingual children makes them smarter or not. And you could probably do something similar with language models. You could probably figure out whether you fine tune on both things, you pre-train on both things. Like, do you get more intelligence by doing that? Right? And one interesting kind of trend is that I haven't seen specifically multilingual stuff, but I've seen, for example, code. If you have a, a large language model that has been trained on code, it actually performs better on a bunch of other benchmarks because code forces it to learn kind of logic in some way. So there's there's definitely stuff there. I, I think there's a lot of kind of room to explore which kind of data sets and, and how you can kind of basically transfer learn some information from perhaps, I don't know, like French into Chinese, maybe less so French into Chinese, more so probably French and Spanish or like Latin languages are all kind of probably similar in, or at least kind of have the same structure-ish. So, I don't know, there's a lot of cool stuff you could do there. GPT-4 is very susceptible to leading questions. Betteridge's Law. I don't know what Betteridge's Law is. Betteridge Law. Betteridge Law is any headline that ends in a question mark can be answered by the word no. Okay, so it's basically like the, the, the theoretical the theory of clickbait. 
how to write the most optimal clickbait. You won't believe what they find in the model. Uh, our model is only trained with cross entropy loss, supervised learning without relying on reinforcement learning from human feedback. So RLHF is based on RL. I think the way we went, there's a video that I made where I explain RLHF, but if I remember, it's basically they're training a value function. And then that value function is used to basically score. But that's separate, separate, that's different from uh, supervised learning in which there's a specific answer. And that you basically say, this is the actual answer. This is the token that you should have predicted. So the probability of this token should have been basically one and all the other probabilities for all the other tokens that you could have possibly said should be zero, right? And that's the standard cross entropy loss that you get uh, in any kind of classification problem. All right, and then you got related work here. Quantization of LLMs focused on quantization for inference time. I think LLM int 8 is also Tim's work. Lossy quantization studied trade-offs for regular rounding. Yeah, so generally quantized models are not going to work as well as the full precision models, but maybe this whole LoRa stuff makes means that you can do it. We use low rank adapters. Many other parameter efficient fine tuning methods have been proposed, such as prompt tuning, tuning the embedding layer inputs, tuning hidden states, adding full layers, tuning biases, learning a mask over weights based on Fisher information and a combination of approaches. So there's a whole rich literature of weird, tiny ways of fine tuning. And we show that lower adapters are able to reach full 16 bit fine tuning performance. To help with a pre-trained LLM, follow the instructions provided in a prompt. Instruction fine-tuning uses input-output pairs of various data sources to fine-tune a pre-trained LLM to generate the output, given the input as a prompt. Yeah, so follow the instructions provided in a prompt, aka instruction fine-tuning, aka chatbot. So here's all the different fucking weird ways that people have made chatbots. What do we got here? Evaluation of biases. So I guess this is whether or not Llama 65B is racist. So you heard it here first, dude. GPT-34 is slightly less racist than Llama 65B. Or no, a lower score indicates lower likelihood of generated bias sequence. So Llama 65B is less racist than GPT-3. Is there any score in which it is higher? Oh, but it's more ageist. Look at that. GPT-3 doesn't care if you're a 60-year-old man or a 10-year-old kid. It'll treat you the same. But Llama 65B is going to tell you to go back to your lawn, you fucking boomer, because <laughs> you don't belong here. I don't know. But there you go. Uh, limitations and discussions. We have shown evidence that our method QLora can replicate 16-bit full fine-tuning performance with a 4-bit model and low-rank adapters. Despite this evidence, we did not establish that QLora can match full 16-bit fine-tuning performance. Yeah, so even uh, Tim, which I'm pretty sure he probably had this, I think Tim used to work at Facebook, so he probably had access to a pretty beefy uh, cluster, and he, he probably spent easily 10 grand on, or more than that, probably closer to the 100 grand on all the different stuff that he did for this paper. But even with that kind of budget, he was not able to fine tune a 65 billion parameter model at 16 bit precision, which just goes to show you just how unreasonable it is to assume that people are gonna be fine tuning these fucking huge models. Do human brains do some kind of quantization? Uh. I think we compress information and we uh, create more efficient uh, embeddings and representations, but quantization is more, I think, a result of the fact that computers are based on this binary system, right? Where everything has to basically be a one or a zero. So information theory is really all based on this idea that 
you have a binary neural Turing machine and how do you kind of, that means that because it's binary and because you have like a very formal definition for a neural Turing machine, you can basically uh, use statistics and derive all these basically optimal proofs for uh, information theory optimal choices such as this NF4. But I don't, the brain is analog, right? There's kind of an infinite resolution. And I think that once you go into analog computers like your brain, the, I don't know if quantum computers are analog, but I know there's light computers, which are also analog, right? So as soon as you go into the analog realm, I don't think that a lot of the things from information theory can be applied. And I might be wrong on that. I don't exactly know, but. I don't know if the brain does quantization in the in the exact uh, way that we're talking about here, because everything here has to do with the fact that you have bits and you can have two bits, four bits, 16 bits, whatever, 32 bits, and like the difference between those matters. While we provide evaluations on MMLU, actually, you know who might answer this question? How much of information theory is contingent on the uh, quanta or on the binary nature of our computers? That's not a very good question. I'm sorry, Bard. Information theory is the study of the quantification, storage, and communication. The binary nature makes it easy to representation in a digital format. Computers can only store zeros and ones. It can also be applied to other information. So you can do information theory on analog signals. So I'm incorrect there. Okay. Yeah, it's not limited, but I don't know. I guess I was just completely wrong. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, and this this pattern of discrete making things easier is also uh, behind reinforcement learning, the Markov decision process, right? The whole, I think one of the most fundamental problems with reinforcement learning is this Markov decision process, which is quantizing the real world, right? It's discretizing the real world. It's saying the real world is a series of steps with a series of actions. It's a graph, right? MDP graph, right? All of reinforcement learning is based on this kind of assumption that you have this world that is discretized in states with these actions that take you in between states. And I just, I think I fundamentally disagree with this. I don't think the real world is like that at all. I think it's like, this is kind of like, you can't discretize the world like this. And as soon as you can't discretize the world like this, then I feel like the Markov decision process kind of like becomes less and less relevant. But I don't know. I don't know, what the fuck do I know, right? Well, we provide evaluations. We perform a very broad study from the evidence presented. It appears the performance of these benchmarks likely depends on similar the fine tuning is to the benchmark data set. Yep. Transfer learning out of distribution generalization. Uh, this highlights that not only the better benchmarks and evaluation is needed, but that one needs to be careful about what one is evaluating in the first place. Do we wanna create models that do well on classroom, high school, and colleague knowledge? college knowledge, I think they probably meant, or do we want to do well on chatbot conversation ability? Yeah, I mean, you could apply the same thinking to society. Do we really care about people doing good on SATs? I think most people understand that performance on the SAT isn't necessarily the best measure of intelligence, but it's kind of the best thing we have. So we're in a similar kind of predicament with uh, these large language models where Yes, we understand that these benchmarks are not necessarily the best way to evaluate them, but we don't really have anything else to do or any other measure to do it. So SATs and LLM benchmarks are actually more similar than you think they are. Certain benchmarks can steer the community towards a certain direction. Yeah, the same way that SAT steers students into a specific direction that's not necessarily the best. Right, this is also a huge problem in uh, whenever you're hiring uh, people to code and programmers, it's like you have to basically get really good at these leak code problems, these like weird little problems where 
you trying to basically solve a tiny little problem in something like 30 minutes and you have to find the solution that has the best time complexity and the best memory complexity and usually it's kind of like weird little tricks it's like recursion dynamic programming these like weird tricks and they fall into these set of patterns and you know i think about all the time that i spent getting good at leak code just to pass a test and then whenever you actually get it to the job you don't end up using any of that shit right because <laughs> it's not actually useful so it's annoying because think about how much time collectively as humanity we've spent getting better at leak code problems and then that hasn't helped at all so you have to be careful about what you put as the benchmark because then the community and the world ends up spending a bunch of time just trying to beat that benchmark uh, while we provide a detailed evaluation another limitation is that we do a limited responsible AI evaluation fine-tuning on the OS OAS T1 reduces the bias of the llama based model so the open assistant data set makes it less uh, ageist and sexist and racist and so on well, these results are encouraging addition limitation we do not evaluate different bit precisions such as using three bit based models yeah so this is something that he talked about in the in the paper too but you could even go lower right imagine representing numbers in three bits like that's insane <laughs> one bit precision besides LoRa, there is now also a wide variety of parameter efficient that have been shown however it is unclear if these methods scale to larger numbers we use LoRa as many results establishes robustness but other adapters might yield better performance since fine-tuning after quantization seems to recover most of the information that is lost this might enable much more aggressive quantization yeah so maybe you can three bit quantize and then fine-tune yeah a three-bit GPTQ quantization of the base model with LoRa might also yield 16-bit performance broader impacts on a single professional GPU yeah I think this paper is very important in terms of open source machine learning because it means that people can now big win for the accessibility of the state-of-the-art NLP yeah huge win you know if this wouldn't have worked and Q Laura was shit and Laura was shit and the only way to fine-tune a model was to basically get a ten thousand dollar training computer and then push gradients into it we would be fucked you know people like you and me who just like small independent people would not be able to contribute in any meaningful way to machine learning and all of the machine learning research would be done by these big giant companies that have huge amounts of money to spend on GPUs. So the fact that QLora works well, I think is a is a blessing because it means that small independent researchers can now be pushing research that is state of the art. Deployment to mobile phones. I'm not really necessarily into this. I think I told you guys my views on whether edge compute or cloud compute is going to win, but there is like a whole community of people that are really trying hard to fit uh, these large language models into like a phone. I think people have done it already. I think people have fit uh, uh, a quantized version of a llama model on a cell phone. So it, it is possible. And I think that there's always going to be kind of a, a community of people that are basically trying to make these as small as possible so that they can fit them on like a Raspberry Pi. Fine tuning is a dual use technology. Widespread use of LLMs has known dangers. Does it? Are those real or are those just fake? I don't know. I think they're kind of fake. Uh, acknowledgements. Okay, so here's all the people that helped. Here's the actual. A research was facilitated by the advanced of the HEAC supercomputer system. What is that? HEAC supercomputer system. Features. The HEAC supercomputer system is 100 nodes, so 100 different GPUs or 100 different server racks potentially get, 
Get me to the documentation, dude. Compute. Start here. Scheduling jobs. Job types. Slurm, dude. Fuck slurm. Slurm is so gross. All right, they don't actually tell us. Okay, whatever. I'm sure we could figure out exactly what those are, but I'm assuming it's just a hundred different A100s. There we go, guys. That's the paper. Got the Culora, different experiments, the quantization bins or the quantiles. Edge AI will probably be useful in certain er use cases, low latency or in areas with no network access, but beefy servers seem way cooler, pun intended. <laughs> that is also it too, right? It's like uh, uh, cooling is actually, I think the limiting factor for, for example, VR headsets, right? In a VR headset, they could actually push the chips to be more performant, but they can't because it doesn't cool fast enough. So uh, that's also the case for consumer hardware. So. Uh, something that's very common that people, I don't know if people do it as much anymore, but one thing you could do is you could basically take the uh, your motherboard and put in a liquid-cooled CPU or put in a liquid cooler and then you can overclock it. And actually the computer that I'm on right now does that. I actually overclock the CPU. So my CPU is running at a higher clock rate, which is going to produce more heat, but I have an aftermarket liquid cooler, which allows it to basically perform or not explode, basically, not melt. But when you're looking at a Raspberry Pi or some kind of tiny little like thing on a cell phone, the, the cooling is actually gonna become the limiting reagent. So in a, in a server, in a cloud data center, you can have very advanced kind of like liquid nitrogen type cooling shit going on. So like cooling becomes less of an issue if you have uh, in a data center than it does on the edge. Okay. Cool. So that was quite a marathon. Um, let me see if I can do a quick little summary and then we'll end this stream. So this paper was Culora. So basically it was a quantization paper coming from the quant god himself, Tim Det Detmers. Uh, there is an accompanying uh, talk for this. I would highly recommend if you continue and you want to see it from, or you want to hear it from the guy who actually wrote it, listen to that. So basically what they did is they have a new uh, tiny uh, precision data type, which they call four bit normal float. And this four bit normal float is basically the, the, the tiniest you can make a uh, floating point. And they have all kinds of assumptions that they need in order to do that. Basically they need to assume that the weights are a normal distribution. And then they end up having, they end up creating this new set of parameters, which they call the quantization constants. And then they end up having to quantize those quantization constants with a technique they call double quantization. So uh, what they're doing is they're taking uh, a large language model such as Llama, which has 65 billion parameters. And rather than uh, uh, fine-tuning that model directly, which means updating each one of those 65 billion parameters with a with a new uh, data set, a new fine-tuning data set. What they're going to do is they're going to freeze that 65 billion parameters. They're going to freeze them, which means they're going to keep them frozen, which allows them to use them at a lower precision. So they're going to use a 4-bit precision for a 65 billion parameter model. And then they're going to add these little, uh, these little extra weight matrices, which they call low-rank adapters, and they're called LORAs. And then those LORAs are where you actually push the gradients. And those LORAs are also quantized, although not as intensely as the original base model. And it turns out that if you do this kind of fine tuning where you're just pushing gradients into these little LORAs uh, and keeping the, the large language model frozen, you can now do fine tuning on a consumer GPU. So drastically less memory, drastically less time, and also the performance seems to be pretty much there. So. Uh, I think this is the best way to do fine tuning right now. I think that uh, this is a huge win for the open source community. It's a huge win for research outside of big uh, big industry labs because it means that anybody can now be doing fine tuning. I think that this approach will probably work with a variety of different uh, 
models and model architectures. I don't think this is limited to large language models. You could do this with vision models. You could do this with other things. Um, so that's the main uh, algorithmic uh, novelty and contributions of this paper. Uh, in terms of the ablation studies and the actual uh, hyperparameter sweeps that they run, this paper is also very good. They do a ton of uh, runs, over a thousand different runs. They test a bunch of different models on a bunch of different benchmarks. They even have a comparison of whether GPT-4 evaluations are better or not than human evaluations, and it turns out that they're pretty good. But and then they even do this uh, lemon picking versus cherry picking analysis. So I don't know, very dense paper, but a lot of stuff, a lot of contributions here. They have state of the art. This is a this is a superstar paper to me here. So yeah, give it a good read and uh, use the uh, bits and bytes library if you want to be doing your own quantization uh, for your own weird special model architecture. Uh, yeah, thanks for watching. Thank you, Nisio, Erland, RW, everybody else who made comments. Thank you for uh, listening and commenting. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to be doing a little bit of coding stream, probably just going to be working on the Discord bot, but we'll see. Maybe I'd do something else. Three hours, one eighth. Tim would love that number. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. Awesome. Thank you guys for listening, and see you guys later.